what you can expect today, and how the rest of the week is shaping up your full forecast straight ahead. Plus, money moves. With the new year right around the corner, now is the time to get your finances in order. Whether you're recovering from holiday spending or looking ahead, we've got everything you need to know. Then, simply the best. All year, we've brought you the top-selling products from beauty to fashion to home and more. And this morning, we're rounding up the very best that 2023 had to offer. And the early bird gets the worm. Yes, that's Hugh Jackman getting up close and personal with our iconic tree. So where are the crabs? The secrets he's spilling when it comes to capturing that perfect selfie with the ultimate symbol of the season today, Wednesday, December 27, 2023. Carolina. Hi, Ren and Gray. Visiting from Comer, Georgia. El Dorado Hills, California. Sumter, South Carolina. And Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Visiting from Wesley, Rhode Island. Ready for 2024. Visiting from Phoenix, Arizona. Long surprise to the trip to New York. Hi, Dad. Back now at 8.13 as 2023 comes to a close, you may be starting to think about new goals, especially when it comes to your finances. So according to a recent Fidelity survey, two thirds of Americans are considering a financial resolution for the new year, but we figured why wait? You can actually start right now. NBC's business correspondent Brian Chung is back. Exactly the person we need. Okay, December, obviously a big spending month. There's a lot of gifts, a lot of holidays. How do you begin to dig out of some of those credit card bills? Yeah, and ahead of the, of next year, you want to get your debt yeah. in order, right? So the first way to approach that is by making a list. You can start from largest to smallest or smallest to largest, whatever works for you. It's going to depend on what your income looks like. But when it comes to the types of debt, credit card debt is really the big one that's mm -hmm. accumulated this year. So balance transfer cards are a good way to take credit card debt from one card, put it onto another where you don't have to make interest payments for up to 18 months in some cases. Mm -hmm. If you could pay it off before then, you wouldn't be paying interest, which is great news. For everyone else try to pay more than a minimum on your credit card but then lastly also try to give your lender a call it's a good way to see if you can hmm. maybe get another type of rate or any type of help because they also don't want to see you default as well. let's walk for a second yeah. talk about interest rates if we can obviously they went up over the past year that can be yep. good news for some of our savings also can make some challenges for some of the purchases we're making right now what does that mean for tax purposes heading into the new year. Yeah, well, I mean, the reason why debt is high is because interest rates are high. But the good news that's associated with that is that you can save a little bit more. So high yield savings accounts, which are offered by a number of banks, I'm seeing four and a half percent, five percent in yeah. some cases. And again, that's because the Federal Reserve has been raising rates this year. But the talking point is that they might not be raising rates into next year, which means that that five percent rate that we're seeing right now that might be the best you're going to get for a little while. So it's a good way to put money, let it sit, and save. That's better than keeping it in a mattress. But, of course, any sort of interest income that comes from a high-yield savings account will be taxable. So watch out for a 1099, which you'll have to file once tax season comes next year. Uh, it always comes due. I know. Okay, sorry. <laughs> moving right along. Yep. What about any deadlines we need to keep in mind for retirement savings? Anything to keep in mind there? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there is a December 31st Sunday deadline for contributions into a 401k or a 403b. Uh, for what it's worth, those that have IRA accounts, you have actually until tax day. So you have a few extra months to be contributing into those. But again, now is a really good time in these final days to make sure, did you maximize your contributions? Mm -hmm. Because again, it's a pre-tax contribution that is then taxed when you take it out. You want to be maximizing that if you plan on maximizing those contributions. The 2024 limits are going to be higher. They're going to be about $500 higher than this year because of the IRS-related uh, inflation adjustments. So try to set aside even a little bit more next year as you're thinking ahead to 2024. And then lastly, College education, super expensive, right? So 529 is a really good way to save for an education tax-free. There are also limits to that that are year-end, so pay attention to that as well. Yeah, nobody wants to imagine what college prices are going to look like <laughs> as big as they can be right now, it just is a few pricey, years certainly. from now as well. Let's talk about looking ahead to 2024. What are some of the smart things we can do now to get our finances in order as we head to the new year? Yeah, well, we talked about 401k and retirement contributions, but another thing that's important is flexible spending accounts, or FSAs. A lot of people get these through their employer, but 
it's oftentimes a use or lose situation. Right. If you don't use what's in that money, it will yeah, be forfeited. Yeah. Actually, billions of dollars every year are forfeited from monies that, that money that's not used in an FSA, which is a shame because the way to drain it is really easy. So in the next few days, again, because December 31st is on Sunday, you can go to FSAstore.com. You can just sit on your couch and just order a bunch of stuff that you need, right? And then ultimately, uh, you can drain that account and then start anew with a new FSA balance next year. And of course, this is a time of giving. A lot of people are donating. So separately from all this FSA stuff, if you are making any sort of donations, save the receipts because there are tax implications of that once you file in the spring. Not a good advice. Always helpful, Brian. Thank you for that. For a little bit of pop start. That's best time better. in the morning when Carson's here, but I'll do my best. <laughs> Thank you, Carson, on the job. Here we go. First up, the color purple, the movie music, uh, three, the mo- see, I told you, well, the, the movie musical is cashing in at the holiday box office. How come you so nice? I don't know. Maybe you too nice. You seem like trouble. I come here out of respect. But if there ain't nothing to get, that show ain't nothing to get. The big screen remake brought in $18 million on its first day alone. That's the second biggest Christmas Day opening of all time behind Robert Downey Jr.'s Sherlock Holmes in 2009. The new movie features songs from the Tony Award-winning Broadway show, as well as a star-studded cast, including Taraji P. Henson, uh, Fantasia Barino, and Halle, Bear, uh, Halle Bailey. Excuse me. Congratulations to all of them. Uh, extraordinary achievement. Next up. Die Hard. For many years, the controversial topic has been heavily debated. Is Die Hard a Christmas movie? While the Bruce Willis-led action flick takes place on Christmas Eve and features Christmas music, some believe its violent plot has held it from maintaining true Christmas classic status. Now, Emma Hemming Willis, Bruce's wife, has weighed in on the decades-long debate. This is what she posted to her Instagram story watching the film simply captioned, Us Two. I think she settled it. She, what do you guys think? It's so us two as in we think We're in. Christmas yeah, it's a Christmas movie. Yeah, us two is Christmas yeah. movie. I think if a movie has a Christmas scene, it's a Christmas movie. It's good holiday yeah. Christmas material. Yes, we watch Godfather on Christmas. Excuse you. <laughs> yeah, that's very festive. <laughs> that's dark. Speaking lovely. Of dark. Violence. Hey, boys, gather around for some mafia death. You know, there's a Christmas scene. The dark side of Dylan Dreyer coming up on the Today <laughs> Show. Next up, Hugh Jackman. Everybody wants to experience the magic of the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree, even Wolverine, the Grammy, Tony, and Emmy winner stepped out for an adventure recently, sharing these snaps of our beloved Christmas staple, writing, I highly recommend getting up really early on Christmas morning and taking a walk to see the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. It's so beautiful and not crowded at all. This is funny. I did get in trouble for going beyond the barrier, but the security guard was nice and let me go uh, with just a warning. Hugh, you are welcome to a VIP tour any time of the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. The security guards would not let us do that. I will tell you that yeah. right now. It's like, here's my badge. I, I love swear. the folks that come in from like Wichita. They're like, uh, it's just us and Hugh Jackman at the Christmas tree that <laughs> Early morning. In the morning. That's a good visit. Hugh, call us next time. Come on. Uh, next up, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, the legendary wrestler and movie star, is looking back on one of his most famous moments. <laughs> This outfit. Uh, Since he originally posted the throwback photo, that signature turtleneck and chain has turned into one of the Internet's 
favorite memes. And now The Rock is rocking that outfit once again to spread some holiday joy. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. 90s rock nipping at your nose. A truly, truly timeless, timeless look. The Rock is the man. He has a nice voice. Not only a nice voice, he's the nicest. I got to hang out with him at Universal when we did the Make-A-Wish. He did the biggest mm -hmm. Make-A-Wish, one of them ever. Yeah. Couldn't be a nicer guy and so awesome. caring and also looks good with long curly hair. Looks yeah. like kid and play with that little look like back <laughs> in the day. <laughs> it looks good. Uh, how about this? Patrick Schwarzenegger. The actor is celebrating a special milestone and an engagement. Yesterday, Schwarzenegger and his new fiance, model Abby Champion, shared these sweet snaps on Instagram in the caption writing, forever and ever. Our pal and proud mom, Maria Shriver, commenting, we are all so happy for you, for your love, for your now, for your future. Your love is inspiring. Joy, joy, joy. We love you, Maria. Congratulations to you and to the beautiful couple. We are wishing them a lifetime of happiness. That's awesome. We are back with today's bestsellers all year long. We have brought you some of the top products in the worlds of beauty, fashion, home, and more. I like this strategy. This is what other people love, and we're going to help you get it for yourselves <laughs> as well. This morning, Shop All Day contributor Chazzy Post is here with the best of the best from 2023, and you can shop them. Just scan that QR code right there on our screen. Good morning. So nice to Good see morning. you. Good morning. Great to see you guys. And first, we've got products for the home, and you may be surprised that three of the top-selling products for home are all cleaning products that will make your life easier. This one's perfect for the morning routine. Yes, starting with your coffee maker. So according to, day to today.com, yeah. you're actually supposed to clean your coffee maker once every three months. So we've got uh, two really easy solutions. So first we have a cleaning tablet. It's the Afresh cleaning tablet. You just prepare to run a full cycle. You just drop it right. Put in. the little tablet in. You run a cycle. <laughs> right. Right. Sorry. <laughs> then you repeat with plain water. And then if you've got a Keurig, you use these little cleaning yeah. cups. Yeah, the pods. Yeah. Right. Oh, you no, pop smart. it in. You run a cycle. Then do another one with only water. And the brand says this is designed to remove mineral buildup and old grounds, which can contain bacteria. I have a bad feeling that people don't clean their coffee makers very no. often. No, but now you can yeah. in yeah. under $10 Easy. and under $6. What else? Okay. So this is a huge favorite of the Shop Today team and our producer, Ariella. She's got two young kids. And this is the Miss Mouse Messy Eater Stain Treater. And she carries this with her everywhere. And it's designed to treat, you know, wet and dry stains and pretty much clean everything from coffee stains. You can see I'm spraying here. Just clothes, though, not rugs, clothes, couches. Also <laughs> rugs, also couches, pretty much everything. And the brand says it'll clean everything from coffee to even markers. And it comes in two different sizes, these little four ounces. You the travel is nice. Yeah, yeah, and it comes in a pack. I mean, you can throw one in your bag, keep one at home or at the office, I mean, Kids aren't the only messy eaters, right? Well, you're talking to parents of two young kids each, yeah, so this, right? this makes good sense for us. The larger size is great for the laundry room. This is a good hack for your oh shower. Oh my gosh, this stuff is so great, super duper popular. This is the wet and forget shower cleaner, this is and good. it does just what it sounds like. You just wet it and forget it. No scrub, no scrubbing, no, scrape, no, no wiping. You just spray it from top to bottom on your shower. I think we've got some video here. You wait eight to 12 hours. And then rinse with warm water. That huh. is it. And this cleans everything from soap scum to everything in between. It'll do your shower walls. It'll do your shower curtain. It It'll does do your the shower grime door. for you. No yes. elbow not, grease needed. Like it smells not too intense. No, no. Yeah. The, the brand says it's bleach free. And yeah. this is enough for 12 weeks. And it's around $18. Wet and forget, not just right? the name. Yes, I know. So good, right? You remember what it does. Okay, for top selling beauty. So first for nail care. This stuff is so great. So oh, unscrew nail care. the top. Oh, yeah. Laura. <laughs> that wasn't for smelling. You've got to smell okay, what this is stuff. Cuticle so this oil? Is, what are we doing? Yes, Cucho yes. Naturel. Um, it's revitalizing cuticle oils, and you just put it on your cuticles uh, this and on your, your nails. You're washing your hands um, so much. All so the dishes right. And you can the also use it on your skin. Yeah. 120,000 ratings, under $10. Okay. This like stuff is the top selling beauty product on shop today all year long. This is the Essence Lash Princess uh, False Lash Mascara. All about the lash. I use this every single day. The brand says one tube of this is sold every 10 seconds. Wow. And it gives you that false lash effect and it's five dollars. Okay. I mean, this is such a winner. Let's keep going. Okay, last got but so not much good least. stuff. This is the Shaper X and this is the tummy control bodysuit. 
This is the top selling uh, fashion item on Shop Today Peter's all year long. Peter's frown about tummy control. <laughs> right? Well, I looked over and I was like, oh, hello. That didn't mean to get fresh. Right. So I'll just stand back. Oh, my yeah. gosh. But here's what everybody loves about it. It gives you shapewear without feeling right. like shapewear. It's really comfortable, but sucks you in. And you can wear it, you know, in the darker colors, you know, even as a tank or as a layering piece, or wear it as you would regular shapewear. Last but not least. Oh my gosh. The coat again is having a real moment this year. Ooh, that's and soft. that's part coat, part cardigan. Yeah. I love it because it's the best of both worlds. It's the shape of a coat, but the softness feel that of your favorite cardigan sweater. Yes. And I also bought this. I think it looks so chic. Jeans, yeah. leggings, Well, that's everything. like a perfect houseware thing, hair. right? Get home from work and just throw <laughs> that out. Well, not that. for me, but yeah, for the ladies right? in my life. And it's yes. real. It's got pockets. It's oversized. This is I think looks so much more expensive Thank than, than so it is. These are so many good ideas. This is so good. Thank you. And by the way, again, to shop these products, simply scan our QR code or head to today.com slash shop. Up next, we'll turn our attention to the hottest beauty trends of the year and what's in store for 2024. So will it be bye-bye Barbie Pink? We're about to find out. But first, this is Today on NBC. This morning on Today's Style, we are looking back at the biggest beauty trends of 2023 and looking ahead, of course, to the trends we'll be seeing more in the new year. Sarah Eggenberger is here, the senior editor of New Beauty. Sarah, good morning. So nice to good have morning. you. Good morning. So let's start with the old from this year. Yes. Devices, all about devices this year. We are seeing so much technology. So it's really enhancing your skincare results with technology that you would get at the doctor's office, but now you can take it at home. So we love it because we're just really seeing great results with it. This balloon yeah. is incredible. It's it's actually microcurrent, which is going to help to stimulate your collagen production, along with massage. So it feels amazing Let's see. while it's treating you. So you can just you can kind of like see that happening. And it's pretty, like little disco it's balls. So like, and you just go up your face with it over and just treat your whole face with this. It's amazing what it does, and it feels so great on your oh, yeah. skin too. Speaking of skincare, here it's all about trying to simplify this year, right? Exactly. So it's about skin minimalism, which is great. I mean, if you love your 10-step routine, all the power yeah. to you. If that's your vibe. But what we want to do here is cover all of our bases and. The emphasis is on efficiency and efficacy. And so this is a program that you could actually cover all your bases with and still have a simplified routine. So starting in the morning on a clean face, you're going to apply your vitamin C. Okay. So vitamin C is something that we do not actually produce naturally, so our body craves it. This vitamin C by SkinCeuticals is liquid gold. Okay. Because when you apply this onto your skin, let's yeah, let's put well, some that on. One's attached. And <laughs> what's going to happen, <laughs> it's, yeah, take it. It's really good for your skin because the skin is actually going to fight inflammation with this because it's okay. actually going to 
after the, all those free radicals that are attracting our skin, we're going to be an antioxidant that's going to protect our oh, skin. That. That's good. Then we have a multitasking beauty product, which is actually your moisturizer, your sunscreen, and your tint all together. Everyone loves Elta MD because it goes on so smooth, yeah. and you're going to have your compliance when you use this product along with it. Elephant, a great brand. Too. Great brand. And then for evening, so now we're going to move into our evening routine. We have our vitamin A, which think of that like exercise for the skin. It's really going to yeah. help to stimulate the skin. Great for all things, breakouts, aging, everything. And then you want to use Drunk Elephant. Just launched this product. It's a great barrier repair cream to really hold in all that moisture into the skin. Latte, all about the latte, the latte colors this year, which is very friendly for mine. It is tone. such a yeah. beautiful look, and it's so yeah. fine to so many different skin tones. What yeah. we're going to look at is monochromatic colors. Mm -hmm. This is just going to give you a wash of color that's going to highlight. It's going to actually just create that emphasis. This is Mario by uh, Makeup by Mario. Just great color payoff with this. Yeah. All these shadows create that smoky look. If you really want to lean into that sultry look, and then also their skin perfector, which is like your bronzer, your highlighter. So you have your skin minimalism with also your latte makeup. Great trend by Makeup by Mario. Okay, out with the old. Out with Old. In and now we're going to go in with the new. Okay. Here we go. We're going to keep so marching along. Taking a into the new year. The sun. It's the new year. Happy New Year, everyone. <laughs> into the beauty trends of Here new. Here we go. We're going to get there. We're the new year exercise. The at new the same year is time. coming. The new year is entering. Yeah. And so, what we're talking about for new year is really exciting. So, we saw a lot of the Barbie core, right? Yeah. Pink. The hangover to pink is now the new. Everything's yeah. red. Okay. Red. We have seen this trend hit us already in winter. You're seeing red tights, red in fashion. Yeah. Also, though, for beauty. So we love this Dior color. 999, iconic. It has graced many magazines. They just today are launching this advanced formulation. I have it on today. I was going to say, it's you're so already beautiful. on trend. Instant, instant confidence booster. Also the MAC. This is another lovely no color. Yeah. Easy to do for OPI with nails. Great way to wear your red classic colors. But it gives you that modern twist on a two with red. Love, Love the look. Okay. So this is really fun. This is, a, if you want to get that c sculpt look. So yeah. bronzing is the way we add that definition, right? How now is we're this looking, different than just blush? So now we're actually looking at applying it to a higher cheekbone to really mm. give you that lift in your skin. Do you skin. have this on too? I do, yeah. yeah I love this. So it's a okay. liquid color that you're just going to actually apply in a C shape. So you're going to start up at your temples and then bring it down. So you're going to lift the face up versus going low with your blush. We always Go want to lift. high with your blush. We lift it up. Lift. And you can do that with this because it's a liquid product, which makes it really easy to blend. Okay. So that's why we love it. And pump up the volume. Pump up the volume. So Pinterest have predicted big hair. Yeah. And get this, stick with me here, also wavy perms for men. It's coming back. Peter that's Alexander, what you they're predicting. That? Wavy perms. <laughs> Just wait. Coming, coming back. Coming for you. <laughs> so also what we have here is you can actually get that big volume with your okay. dry bar. If you want to use your rollers, bring them back out again. Okay. Use your dry rollers. Also, don't forget about texturizing spray that just adds that grit. Moroccan oil has a great product. And the and this pro helps tip, the curls stay put. It sure does. Yeah. Yep. Put this in, spray at your roots, kind of judge it up a little bit. And then this is the pro tip here. If you want to add volume, that look of illusion that you have thicker mm -hmm. hair, actually paint your scalp with what we paint call the scalp. paint the scalp. Okay. It's going to add that volume because if you see your scalp, it actually makes your hair look thinner. So if you want that thick, voluminous hair, Madison Reed, Love it. go with it. Foundation. Sarah, thank you so much. <laughs> so much good news here. And curlers for uh, Peter whenever he needs it. <laughs> All right. We'll send them over. <laughs> <laughs> over to you guys. Mm. Excuse me. Up next, Vanessa Price, our favorite sommelier, is here to help us elevate our New Year's Eve cocktail game. This is delicious. Yeah. But first, this is Today on NBC.
We are back at 8.51 with Today Food. This morning, our friend and sommelier, Vanessa Price, is here to help us get ready to ring in the new year. Vanessa, so nice to have you here. Thank so whether you. you are throwing a big bash or keeping things low-key, Vanessa knows all the tips and tricks for incredible cocktails for your big New Year's countdown. Good morning. Nice to see Good you. Good morning. So, Happy almost New Year. And to you as well. So let's start. We're not messing around. You brought the No, we're today. going. Yeah, we're going for the this big stuff. This is real stuff. So, so opening the champagne. Start yes. at scratch. How, what is the strategy, the trick to doing that? Okay. So secret number one. Mm -hmm. There's actually a lot of pressure in this bottle. So yeah. this is something that's really important for you guys to know at home. Whenever you're opening a bottle, make sure it's really cold because that's going to give you a little bit more control over yeah, what you're doing. Just wipe it down if it's a little bit wet. So you've got your towel right there so okay. you can get a good grip on it. Um, the, do you know how much pressure there actually is? Well, it's everybody between... in the studio is wearing goggles, so I think they have a bad <laughs> feeling how this is going to go. On you. Well, it's between <laughs> 80 and 90 PSI, okay. which translates to about three times that of a fully pumped car tire. So we're talking about a lot of pressure. Yeah, I'm right inside yeah. this bottle. So Be careful, the whole reason Peter. that we want it, no do pressure. This with a sword Lots at home, of pressure, so but no pressure. Scene. Yeah. <laughs> so you just want to take that foil off. You see, it just peels right off. It's going to yeah. be like that on any really? champagne bottle. Then here's the secret, okay? Okay, so are you right-handed or left-handed? Right-handed. You're right-handed. So you want to put your right hand on top of the bottle. Right. Well, you want which is counterintuitive, thing, right? No, not yet. No. Oh, yeah. Geez, so okay. do you want to turn this the other way? This is just so, so dangerous. Here we go. You're giving away. Yep. I get nervous. So you here we go. So now, right hand, the left hand, because <laughs> this is your non-dominant hand. Right is going to untwist the case. This is, we call I do this. not take these precautions, so this is good. There we go. And now you're just going to pick it up. I think I shook it. Right hand. No, it. you're fine. You're fine. So yeah. right hand stays on top. Left okay. hand goes on the bottom. <laughs> yeah. Dominant hand on top. Now you're going to use your non-dominant hand just to turn. And you're just going to hold on. Oh, you got to see. I've got turn my hand that? on the cork. Oh, right. So then you just turn the this bottle. Is gonna go really oh, I did it. <laughs> and if you just kind of. Success. Ease it out. See? Oh, I get a little uh, bit we of drink a... champagne there for breakfast go. every morning, and it's not there new, we go. Usually, it's difficult. There we go. <laughs> you want to skip the glass? We uh, can yeah, do let's, that. Let's pour. And then just a nice little easy pour, as long as you don't pour too fast. The trick to holding the bottle, just straight up and no, down. No, honestly, actually, you, well, I know with people with beer, they always think that it's a bit the same with champagne, yeah. but honestly, you don't need to do that. Oh. You can just um, okay. lay it down in a... And pour it. Cheers to you. I'm going to work yeah. on the other Salute. ones while you go the rest of the way. Vanilla infused. Tell me about that. Yes. So you could either choose to do a uh, vanilla infused vodka. So this is the confetti ready. Okay. Um, it's a play on, um, obviously, you know, sparkly. If you can't tell, I like that for New Year's Eve. Um, <laughs> this is vanilla infused vodka. Um, your champagne. You could use Prosecco, Cava, whatever you like. A little bit of simple, just mm. a little bit of sweet. And these are actually pop rocks that are garnishing oh, the, cool. um, the top and of the glass. what do you to keep them on there? So that's vanilla frosting. So oh. you just roll it in the vanilla frosting, put your pop rocks on, and then garnish. Love so you it. could you could use one that's store bought, or you could infuse your own, just using vanilla beans. Just do it about a week in advance. Okay, it can yeah. last that long. Good, to it know. can last that long. Hmm. Okay, uh, Vanessa, what is this called? A blizzardada? A blizzardada. Yeah, All right, right, so this one is a take on a um, pina colada. Okay. So we've still got the fresh pineapple, the the frozen pineapple, the fresh pineapple juice, mm -hmm. the coconut, um, but we've actually added a that coconut rim to it to wow. mimic that's snow cool. a little bit. You know, we're getting into the holiday season. Get in there. Um, if it's not quite white yes. enough to reflect the snowy sort of wintry white look that you oh, want, wow. you can just add a little bit of white food coloring to it just to give it that extra oh, snowy good. look. They make right? white food use, coloring? They do, yes. Come on. I've never mm -hmm. used it. This could oh, be an yeah. interesting morning oh, for oh, yeah. uh, I know. today. Uh, i got to anchor from about 12 to 2 on news now. We'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, so I would use a cava oh. or a Prosecco, something like that. I wouldn't necessarily go champagne for this because you're not going to get so much of the champagne flavors in a cocktail. So this, my waist is on this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There you this go. That one's delicious. That is delicious. This is very interesting. Red wine, hot cocoa. Yeah, so this oh. is actually, um, we, we were chatting backstage about this. This is one of the trends of the moment is mixing milk with red wine. Mm -hmm. I made this with my family over the holidays, okay. which is a lot of fun. And? So my stepmother helped me uh, perfect the recipe. Mm -hmm. She was like, it needs to be a little bit stronger. So we added some <laughs> bourbon to it. Um, so it's oh, got wow. red wine, hot cocoa. Yes, yeah, so you've got the fresh oh, milk. Oh, my goodness. It's really, it's a lot so of fun. So milk and red wine isn't a weird like no, I mean, combo? it's no, not really. So we also added Dutch cocoa powder. There's mm -hmm. bourbon in there. There's a little bit of vanilla extract. Awesome. So it just sort of amalgamates. Well, this is delicious. Thank yeah, you it's my so pleasure. That's a happy new year. Happy Make sure new you year. can uh, check out these drinks and more by scanning uh, that QR code you see on the bottom of your screen. You can always go to today.com slash food as well. Thank you. Oh, that is good. Isn't it? Wow. It's rich Thank you and very delicious. Much. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, I lost my champagne. You need it. your new oh, yeah. champagne, too. <laughs> All right, we are back Thank right you. after this. This morning on the third hour of today, reaching new heights. 
meet the mountain climbing mom of seven on a mission to teach her kids an important lesson about grit. Plus, plant yourself right there and watch Craig go on the job at a nursery. Let's hope all these plants are still alive tomorrow. Find out if he has what it takes to get a green thumbs up. Then, you're gonna love the way these cookies crumble. That's why they call us the crazy cousins, yes. because we literally had no background in baking. And now, they're making serious dough. We'll go behind the brand Crumble to find out how they did it. And in she made it, a company rooted in Latin American culture. The entrepreneur mom trying to change your hair care routine. Today, Wednesday, December 27th, 2023. From Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the third hour of today. And Al, along with Craig, Chanel, Dylan, it is a holiday halt day. day. Woo! We're not going to uh, get it. We like that. You need, like, yeah, right. jingle bells for it. Yeah, that's it. Oh, yeah. that's, yeah. yeah, yeah. The button so, is taking a vacation. So uh, a lot of folks are going to be traveling uh, during this time of year. Town & Country Magazine spoke to a flight attendant and frequent travelers about etiquette that should be followed when flying. For okay. example, right. one of the things that drives me nuts, yeah. especially when you're on the plane, mm -hmm. somebody, as soon as, especially when you land, yeah. people get on the phone, they put their, their phone on speaker, speaker. and then oh, start talking, do, telling yeah, people, hey, I just landed, uh, so that I'm going to be getting, a, I'm going to get my bag, and then I'm going to, I will say, like this. I, I, uh, not to sound whatever, I find a lot of times the people who are doing that are older. No. I've, I've, you would oh, think if they're older, they could hear better if they held it to head. their or, ear. Or, or, or people playing music. Oh, you know, no, that's, that's you know, yeah. it's like, but who still does that? They, they do. Mm -hmm. you know, so say, use your headphones, use your headphones. okay, please. Right, that's another one. Uh, uh, don't oh, take, don't take waiting call. Don't take calls in like the bigger waiting areas or on the plane. Just wait till you get to Girl. a quieter section. Okay. Uh, now, this, and this is something I do believe in, flight attendant says, you should put some effort <laughs> into what you wear when you travel. <laughs> what does that mean, Prince of like, I agree. In other words, there's some like, I mean, people really are walking crusty on in like on. shorts and sleeveless t shirts. I, I, and I, my bigger pet peeve, we were on a flight recently, and, and my son is of an age now where he has started to notice girls. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there was a young lady who was wearing something like she was going out to the club <laughs> as soon as she landed. And like, <laughs> and maybe stomach, she was. Stomach was out, pants were a little tight. And people who dress like that, how comfortable can you be? They can't be like well, women in like heels. And like, so yeah. Del was like, dad, you see that? I was like, nope. <laughs> No, I don't see anything, no, son. Wow. You don't either. I took two pictures, but I didn't see it. <laughs> yeah, did you see that? You, no. should, you should dress appropriately. No, it's funny because look, I'm, I'm from an up. well, I'm from an yeah. era before air travel was a common thing. It yeah. was a big deal, and my dad made us get dressed up. We had to put on a you know a sport at least a sport coat, shirt and a tie. You still do that. He, you like ride your bike in that? Well, I mean, no, but I, I, here's the exception to me: is if if like you're on an overnight flight, right. you know, like you're. you know, That's you know. the exception. That's the exception. <laughs> As most of us are on overnight. I like to dress up just as much as the next guy. I'm talking about dressing up. No, but you're right. on a you know what? I, up. I remember one time when I went home and uh, home to Wichita and I had these and I spent a nice little penny on these jeans. They were like these holy jeans. And my grandparents would wait for me when I got off the plane. I remember landing in Wichita, and I went up to my grandfather, and he said, they paying you? <laughs> <laughs> are they paying you? <laughs> and I'm like, no, Grandpa, these, this is, these are nice. These are like, these are jeans. jeans. He's like, He's like no, why would you buy jeans that have whole? I'm with you. Like, he just, I'm but that's right. Are they paying you? That's funny. Okay. Well, <laughs> while we're on the topic of travel, <laughs> here are some trends that Expedia is predicting for 2024. Uh, one of the trends using oh. generative AI oh. to plan a trip, like asking uh, Chat GPT. We've talked about this. A, we should itinerary. do that as a buddy up. That would Just be have fun. it plan like a day in the city. That's fun. And see where it takes us. I say yes. Right? All right. Okay. 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 In fact, they, Expedia says 40% of travelers surveyed said they would try we that tool. That's kind of fun. Yeah. Okay. Then, right. then there's another one. Set jetting. What is that? Right. In other words, you, you there's a favorite show you like, and you oh. go to to uh, see the show, go to the city where the oh, show right. is filmed, cool. where the exteriors right. are. Well, like, like that, that show. Um, uh, White um, Lotus. Yes. Yeah. People are a lot going, of people going to those so locations. Resorts. You know, 
That it, wasn't what I was thinking of, but that worked just the same. Oh, but were you in Ted Lasso? <laughs> no, I was. I still can't think of it. Okay, okay it's fine. There <laughs> you go. Also, uh, uh, dupes. Uh, it's a trend about going to a more affordable alternative to a place. Like go. Oh, to, it's like the look for less. Like exactly. Go to your t- <laughs> you go to Taipei. Instead of Seoul. Or, yeah, so I where Al goes versus where we would like, <laughs> But wait a minute. Like wait, Taiwan. Can I, can I ask a question? Hold on a second. Uh, where were you when you lost your luggage? Yes, you're right. You're that's right. True. Well, you're, no, 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 in no, all just, fairness, no, 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 in all no, fairness, no, my well, in-laws. It's, 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 simple question. It was a gift from where, my in-laws. Where were Last you? I, I believe it was. Where were you and your entire family I, I was, when you I was, was in Sicily. Sicily. For I, how long? How I long were you in Sicily? I didn't wait for the trip. No, 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 no. I'm just asking a question. Asking a question for a friend. Where were you? When you lost your luggage. We were in Sicily, but I didn't pay for it. Okay, fine. Oh, so you went did for free. Did you lay down on the plane? No, <laughs> All right, next one. And what did you wear? Uh, oh, no, I had no luggage. Oh, oh, I wore the same oh, thing every day. Speaking, <laughs> here we are almost in the new year. Okay, here's the new year's resolution. Yeah, you will never speak of this it. again. Oh. oh, that's a good resolution. That is. For all of us. Uh, it's a group resolution. I'm ready to bite your nails. I'm ready to bite your nails. Friends. Uh, food trends. Better Homes and Garden looked at the trend forecast and spoke to experts about what food trends they expect to see next year. Okay. Rise of solo dining. My uh, favorite kind of dining. You yeah. like that? Oh, my When's God. When's the last time you went out to eat by yourself? Two weeks ago. Yeah, when you really? travel. Oh, the, every no, day. not traveling. Like, Oh, I go out in town for lunch really? by myself all the time. And what do you do? Do you look at your phone or anything? Sometimes I'll take a book. Yeah. Sometimes I'll watch I do movies. like that. Yeah. The yeah. book read. I like that. You know, when I had jury duty, I remember going down to uh, after jury, during jury duty, you get that lunch, mm-hmm. yeah. that lunch break. You sit there, you got a book, you sit all on right. the park. Another trend. Oh, okay. Um, so we had the solo dining. Mm-hmm. There's also... Uh, Everything old is new again. Nostalgia. Uh, food companies nostalgia. are refreshing. Nostalgia. They, for example, Brian, you've got, uh, remember Dunkaroos? Dunkaroos? Thanks, B. Thanks, B. Okay. Oh, my. That's funny. I don't goodness. know Dunkaroos. Oh, I have to introduce you to the Dunkaroos. Really? I don't know Dunkaroos either. It is a cookie with a side it's, of you know frosting. Why? We grew up poor. <laughs> that dunk- <laughs> That's what that it is. You, we grew up, you didn't grow up with money. Well, I, I didn't, they didn't have Dunkaroos when I was a kid. You just Look, you had a cookie, you had milk, cookie, you're done. Yeah, that wasn't in my lunchbox. And box. you Dunkaroo it right into. <laughs> what the fuck is laughing? That doesn't look like a rich thing. I haven't had gluten in a really long time. This is delicious. <laughs> so is that, that's called, a, when you put it in, it's called you Dunkaroo. That's what I called it. It's a cookie and icing. Mm. That's the next trend. It's okay. so good, isn't it? More variety. Try that. Spice. Oh, Ooh, I don't want that. You spice. like frosting? I do like frosting. Try it. Spice. Okay. Spice. I like spice. Spice. Whole Foods <laughs> Markets 2024 Top 10 Not Food true. Trends no. <laughs> says global peppers about to start Ooh. popping up in every aisle, including the drink section. Okay. What? Yes. A little yes. spice. Like, we yeah. like spicy. That, oh, we don't have that sample? If we look oh. over, we're like, where's that spice? You bring us dumb caroos. Well, think about it. Okay. I love that we all went like this. How many things have you seen now in the aisles for with ghost pepper? That's true. Ghost pepper is ghost pepper's having Chips. a moment. You know? yeah. And also, uh, when we talk about drinks, yeah, uh, a lot of drinks now are going to be, a lot of people are getting away, continuing last year, booze-free, you know, mocktails, yeah. things like that. Mm. You're seeing those more in mini bars in, in hotels that. and such. Okay, so okay. I'm a fan of that. I told you, your Aperol Would Spritz, you the, the non-alcoholic oh, ones. Yeah, I'll try the Delicious. Dunkaroo. And by the way, you want an alternative to the Aperol Spritz. Yeah. It's now the Saint-Germain Spritz, Ooh. so an elderberry spritz. Oh, that Ooh. sounds yummy. Okay, that's, that's just really ahead, sweet. Well, it's a fasting. mountain climbing mother of seven with grit, of the life-changing moment that inspired her to reach for new heights over and over again. And then later in our series on the job, we know, Craig, you love a good house plant. I do. Find out if he can hack it as a green employee. We'll be right back. That, by the way, that really-
We are back now with our series Grit. And if you're thinking of a resolution for yourself in 2024, this one may inspire you to reach for new heights. I recently caught up with a mountain climbing mother of seven who's pushing her limits and is showing her kids that anything is possible. Hard work works. Happy to be here. 43-year-old mountain climber Jennifer Drummond is standing on top of the world. <laughs> and scaling summits has taken her life to new heights. The business owner and mom of seven first got a taste for hiking in 2015 when she moved her family to Park City, Utah. Five years later, after surviving a serious car accident, Jen found a new lease on life. All of a sudden I realized we have this limited time here on Earth. I wanted to climb a mountain for my 40th birthday that was coming up. With the help of her coaches and mentors, she began training, exercising whenever she could between work and the children's schedules. And she even set a goal for herself to become the first woman to climb the Seven Second Summits. So tell me about the Seven Second Summits. What exactly is that? The Seven Second Summits are the second highest point on each continent. Harder than the first seven, steeper, less traveled, less commercial assistance, and a little bit more remote locations. Over the next few years, Jen traveled the world, seeing her dream through until she faced a challenge in Indonesia. Jen said she couldn't climb Mount Sumantri due to the area's political conflict. Instead, choosing to climb Mount Townsend in Australia. There is a lot of snow, there's a ton of wind, but we pushed through. It was a lot harder than expected to get up here today, primarily due to altitude, I'm guessing. And I ducked and a rock hit my helmet and my shoulder. There's different cues from the environment that you have to take, and then you decide how close you want to flirt with that line. We made it to K2 Summit. It's a lot of work. Were you ever scared? Yes, yes, of course I'm scared, <laughs> all the time. There's spots where you're saying, you want me to go from here to there? I don't have wings. Like I have to use my feet to get from here to there. If I'm super scared, I'll channel one of my children. They don't have fear for some reason. The mom and mountaineer channeling and thinking of her family every step of the way. We'd make little gummy bear snacks for me to take with. The red gummy bears, anytime I ate one of those, that means I was getting love from my family. The white book gummy bears were courage. Jen completed her most recent venture in June, tackling Canada's Mount Logan. We're moving up the mountain and you just feel humbled by the power of life and the fact that it wasn't me that summited, it was all of us that summited. Every single person that was cheering me on from wherever they were in the world and just knowing that I am signifying what's capable and what's possible for all of us. Back at home, Jen uses her climbing experience to help others move their own mountains. How do you get your kids to kind of get over the hurdles that they're going through? We have the term in our house, what's your Everest? And so when my kids are going through a really hard time, they'll be like, mom, I have an Everest right now. I'm like, okay, so let's break it down because you climb a mountain one step at a time. You like it. it might not be big to me, but what they're using that term, that means it's the biggest thing going on in their life. You are living proof of, of grit and what can be done. So what advice do you have for people? The best way to have grit is to have an unbelievable team, to share and communicate what you're going through, what you're doing, what you desire, because that cues the people around you how to support you. The more that you can be true to yourself and communicate that truth, the more the universe can provide the people that you need to make the thing happen. Such an inspiration. Jen tells her story in a new book that comes out next month. She called it Break Proof. And she says she's bringing three of her kids with her to climb Mount Kilimanjaro in February. Wow. Man, that's amazing. <laughs> to watch Jeez. her climb. Whew. No, to climb with To her. climb with them. Wow. Like, you can't Sorry. watch somebody climb Yeah, I'm down. like, see you, hey. see you when you get down. <laughs> That's, Man. That's a great story. Yeah. All right, coming up, uh, I'm going to take you on the job at a business where they really value growth. Uh, what I learned when I spent the entire day working with plants. And then later in our series, The Upside, a CEO by day who strikes a much different tune at night. Third hour of today, right back after this.
Welcome back now with our series on the job where we get to try out other careers for a day. And I recently got to show off my green thumb at my happy place. Home, garden, and gift emporium, Terrain in Westport, Connecticut. Even though my roots are firmly planted at the Today Show, I was looking forward to my first day as an employee at Terrain. What's up, Deb? I'm excited about my first day. Hey! Mwah. We're gonna have some fun. We're gonna have some I'm fun. Excited. Come on in. Come on in. After you, boss. Let's go. Deb Herbertson is a supervisor in the design department. She's been working here for about 10 years. Why is I'm it so here. I don't know. First, I put on my uniform. Is this where I put my tips? I put my tips. <laughs> and got a quick tour so I could get the lay of the land in case any customers needed directions later on. Candles, of course, we oh, love Oh, I love the candles we here. We love our candles. We're just getting some neat seasonal ones in. These so are fall candles. Then Deb handed me off to Peggy, a store associate who today is responsible for keeping the plants hydrated and healthy. This is a pitcher plant, so they love to stay moist. So you're gonna water a Wait little a bit. Minute. That's plant. how you yeah. water the plant? You gotta water it like that. What? There you go, much. whoopsie. That's right, still learning on the job training Yeah, here. and move down this way here. Take, yeah. Let's roll, this yeah, roll, help me roll the cart. Yeah. This is a moisture meter, and oh. with any plant, you can see it says dry or wet. Got my moisture meter here, stand there we by, go. I can tell you. And then you can also mist it. Oh, now that one says it's moist. So there you go. My first solo task, testing and watering the rest of the plants in the atrium. That's bone dry. Gonna put a little water in there, all right. Uh-oh, that may be a little much. That's okay, that's okay, Craig, that's okay. Boop, boop, boop. I'm not sure why I'm making that noise, but it seems appropriate. We'll just give them all a little, little spread, a little shower. I need a little water there, buddy. Let's hope all these plants are still alive tomorrow. Mission accomplished. Next up, flexing my creative muscles over at the design bench with Deb. Okay, so the real work begins. Back here is where we make the things for the floor. We make beautiful arrangements for people to come by. Here's your model. This kind of looks like, I don't know, that a cool. A succulent that... spaceship. Yes. OK. I he like might... that. Like right there? Tuck, yes. Tuck him right in, baby. So any piece we're making, we always want our eye to travel. You want a little bit of focal point. So let's think of like this sweet. I this... was just looking oh, at that. Oh, he's like, whatever. I was just looking at that. Coil a little what do you bit. think, like right there? I think so. I think the pink might be a nice contrast. I think That's really one, pretty. I, I it's think, a color we don't really have yet. Uh, I know. You know, I'm going to say, if this little morning gig you have doesn't work out, <laughs> I'll uh, I'm going to say you got a future here. Once I mastered plant design, it was time for my hardest assignment yet. Now, we are a retail store. Oh. So no matter what, even if you're back here working in the trenches, you're going to be working with customers. Oh, boy. So I think uh, now is the time to get you out there and let's, uh, let's meet your public. Let's, let's, hit, let's, let's hit the let's, floor. Let's, let's work with some customers. Oh, Hi. welcome to Terrain. Thank you very Nice much. to meet you. I'm nice Craig. To meet you. I'm Kathy. Nice to meet you. Kathy, what, what can I help you with? So I want to get a gift for a friend of mine. Yep. And I'm not sure if I should get something like this. I'm going to have you fill out this request form. Oh, great and, idea. Um, great, great, great. What's your, what are you looking to spend? 100? Might I suggest 400? Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> Here to help, sir, with the hat. Do you need, do you have any questions? Candles are in the back. Which one do you like better? Which one's more expensive? Do you have your wallet? No. How are you going to pay for it? We only accept cash. You have cash? You're not going to be able to take this out. No, you can't afford that. Get that back. Thank you. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Welcome to Terrain. I just need to know where the ladies' room is. <laughs> the bathroom. Uh, yes, I know where the. So you're gonna you're gonna go that way. You're gonna make soon. The work day was winding down, but Deb had one last job for me. Earlier today, we had somebody call and say, "We're having a party. It's an outdoor party. Could we get a little something for our centerpiece yeah. outside?" And I thought maybe. This was gonna be it. Do you wanna make a delivery for Terrain? Yes! Our request came from Lindsay Melvin. <laughs> well, I will be taking this home yes. for a weekend party. All right, my friend. I love okay. that. Thank oh. you for everything, it was so much fun. Another satisfied customer. That was fun. Like when I get yeah. fired from this job. <laughs> that's that's what you got something. Do. That I've, is I've, your happy place. I've lined it up. They've said once I lose this, I love it. that I can go there. He's even growing moss on his north side. <laughs>
Deb, thank you. Big thanks to Deb and the entire team at Terrain for, for making this plant dad very, very happy. That plant dad? Fun. Plant dad. <laughs> okay. Wow, he's putting down roots. Still to come, we're going behind a delicious brand. How two cousins with no baking experience chipped in to create a cookie empire that's far from crumbling. Then later in She Made It, meet the mom behind a groundbreaking hair care line built on Latin American beauty secrets. Third hour of today, I'll be right back. We are back with our series, Behind the Brand. Recently, we met two cousins who took a big leap together. These smart cookies are the founders of Crumble, and they are enjoying sweet success. I would never have guessed that I would be talking about sprinkles and pink frosting over a conference table, and that this would be our career. For Sawyer Hemsley and Jason McGowan, cookies are their business. Why cookies? Every family event, cookies were there. They're, you know, a simple product to make and everyone loves them, they're nostalgic. The duo, who are cousins through marriage, first teamed up when Sawyer was still a college student and Jason was working full-time in tech. We started a little business beforehand and it didn't work out, but we really liked working with each other. So did you guys do a lot of baking before this? <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> That's why they call us the crazy cousins, yes. because we literally had no background in baking, aside from just like helping mom and grandma. But what we did is we networked with people that knew more than we did. Mm -hmm. YouTube, read tons of different recipes and cookbooks. In 2017, after landing on a recipe they were proud of, Sawyer and Jason opened their first crumble location in Logan, Utah. I remember thinking like, wait, this could work. This could work other places. And both Sawyer and I are like, let's quit our jobs. Let's just go all in. In six years, they've zoomed from one store to over 960. That's a crumble location in all 50 states, making them the fastest growing dessert chain in the US. We had a lot of organic growth. We never actively went out to sell franchises. Naturally, people were tagging their friends and family and they said, we want you to bring crumble to our community or we want to open a store in our town. And that's how the rocket ship started. And it, we haven't looked back since. What role has family played in, in, in your success? They played a role in, in all of our success. So when we got going, our very first franchisees were Sawyer's parents and Sawyer's uh, siblings mm -hmm. and my next door neighbors. Even when they're like, I'm not so sure this is gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> they but they were it. still there. A key ingredient to their success has been moving beyond their original chocolate chip cookie recipe, selling over 275 rotating flavors. I think that's what makes us completely unique from any bakery or dessert shop is we have a new lineup every week that gets our customer base excited. And Crumble has had a cookie version of just about everything from the classics to the more creative. Has there been a variety of cookie that you thought, man, this is going to be huge <laughs> and then not so much. The one that I can think of off the top of my head is an everything bagel cookie. <laughs> the good thing is we have a rotating menu. We can rotate it right out. Like many modern business booms, they found success on social media, drawing in followers for their weekly flavor announcements and inspiring thousands of cookie reviews. That is good cheesecake. I'm gonna say 8.3. 8 
We didn't just build this business by ourselves. We build it with our customers. And sometimes they don't like a certain flavor and they'll let us know, well, that's part of the fun. I had to try it as well. This is good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious about the churro. Nice cinnamon, that's, that's very lovely. Sawyer and Jason are aiming for something even sweeter than just cookies. Another big part of it is those meaningful moments where they kind of step away from social media for a second, maybe just spend a little bit of time with their family members or on a date night. Creating those meaningful moments to us is actually what drives us every single day to have people just spend a little bit more time with the people that matter most. And like any good dough, Crumble continues to expand, opening <laughs> new locations in Puerto Rico and Canada. So they are truly funny. crossing borders. They are all the rage. My we nieces were in. and nephews are obsessed. Yeah, I was just going to say yeah. my kids beg for them. That was a sweet story. But um, All right, now to our series, The Upside. We recently met a multi-talented CEO in Charlotte. He spends his days running a major corporation and his nights pursuing a lifelong passion. NBC's Ann Thompson found out how he does it. Everything it's not unusual for a musician to have a side hustle. We can work this all now together. Another job that pays the bills between gigs. <laughs> Though each note he plays from his album enough, and the words he wrote energizes him. Eugene Woods kept his worlds separate. That changed during the pandemic when um, sort of these worlds came together. His friends call him Gene, and his day job is in a hospital. Well, actually, 67 of them across six states as CEO of Advocate Health. Have you ever been stopped by a patient who said, I've heard your music? Well, I have, as a matter of fact. Really? Yeah, and it's, it's, it's quite, you know, heartwarming for them to actually pay that much attention because we're trying to pay <laughs> attention to them. Advocate Health, based in Charlotte, North Carolina, is the nation's third largest nonprofit hospital system. Gene oversees 150,000 employees and 6 million patients. Does music help your day job? Leadership and music are connected in really amazing ways. Sometimes what I do is more like a conductor of a classical symphony, where everybody has these orchestrated parts. During the pandemic, it was more like leading a jazz band. You know, because you really, uh, it's about improvisation. We can work it out. Does it calm you down or, or does it energize you? What's it, what's the impact of music on you? It grounds me, uh, you know, it's sort of my meditation. And it, I think it allows me to be a better leader because I come to the job with a different sensibility. Gene's American-born father loved jazz. His mom, a native of Spain, flamenco music and dancing. Just kind of seeped into to my DNA. And I think that's really in part responsible for me being a musician. I just heard it every single day. It was, a, it was the soundtrack of our lives. Growing up in Spain where his dad served in the US Navy, Gene's uncle introduced him to the guitar. His parents bought him one when they moved to Philadelphia. It wasn't until years later that I found out my father forwent three months of rent to buy me a guitar and an amp. And to this day, it's the best investment in my education because they couldn't afford college. His musical ambitions nurtured in garage bands. Paying gigs at Penn State helped finance his undergraduate and master's degrees. The public performing stopped as he climbed the corporate ladder in healthcare. But Gene kept playing and writing in his off hours. Music has never left my life. Now fronting Gene Woods and the Soul Alliance. He plays with musicians who back James Brown and John Mayer in a studio owned by Grammy winning producer Glenn Tabor. It doesn't matter where you come from and who you are and what your day job is. You either bring it or you don't. Yeah. And and Gene brings it or these guys wouldn't be. Your brother is in chains, we should. Singing into the microphone Prince used to record Purple Rain, Gene has found life's elusive equilibrium, an album, music videos, and the corner office. People talk about work-life balance. I talk about really work-life harmony. Um, because I think when these pieces come together you, and integrate, you can be, I think, your, your, your whole selves, your best selves. That was impressive. Yeah. Was. I'm always impressed with people who can use, first of all, like kind of both sides of the brain. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, just to be a renaissance person. Yes. Right?
I love that. And thank you. All right, coming up, another impressive CEO. We'll meet the woman creating a hair care company that also celebrates her heritage in She Made It. Then later, a sisterhood of women bonding over a game they used to play as kids. But this is more than just about having fun. We'll be right back. For she made it, and a woman who made hair care history. Ceremonia is Sephora's first Latina owned hair care brand. It's the brainchild of a mom and entrepreneur whose parents came to the U.S. from Chile. Today, lifestyle and commerce contributor Jill Martin Brooks recently met up with her at the company's new flagship store right here in New York City. With Ceremonia, it's my homecoming, it's a way for me to embrace my natural beauty. A lot of people think that everyone in Latin America has brown hair, but we have redheads, blondes, we have all. Baba Rivera is the founder of Ceremonia, a clean hair care brand designed to help protect, revitalize, and style a diverse body of tresses. We became the first Latina founded hair brand to enter Sephora nationwide this year, and that just speaks volumes for the untapped opportunity. Ceremonia was influenced by Baba's unique Latinx heritage, memories of being raised in Sweden, and quality time spent with her father. Tell me about your brand and what your focus was when you began and what it's evolved into. We're all about hair wellness. And I think for me, it's interesting because I grew up with a hairdresser dad from Chile. And I basically feel like I grew up with a front row seat to all the secrets of Latin American beauty. He would give me scalp massages, he would oil my hair. And as a kid, I appreciated it. But then when I went into my teenage years, I thought it was super embarrassing. And I started to get my beauty inspiration from the magazines. Baba says that the messaging she saw reflected traditional beauty standards, not her own culture and identity. I had really beautiful hair as a child, and then I started bleaching it. I straightened it every day, and I was constantly fighting the frizz, and I ended up in this vicious cycle of trying to fit in. And years later, after relocating to the United States and building a career in marketing, Baba felt inspired to return to her roots. Embracing lessons learned at an early age about keeping her hair healthy, she launched Ceremonia in October 2020 after the birth of her oldest daughter, at first, self-funding its formation. A scalp oil is the signature item that started it all. We're really famous for our Aceite de Mosca. It's super lightweight. You apply it directly on your scalp and you give yourself a little massage with oh, our wow. massager. It helps to combat flakes, greasy roots, helps to remove itching and also to remove product buildup. Growing up, you didn't see people like you who you can model yourself after. How important is that? Representation matters so much to me because now that I'm an adult and a mom of two young daughters, I realized that growing up, I never saw anyone with my heritage do big things. And I think for me, representation is at the core of self-esteem and also believing that you can. Who is the ceremonia person? The Hispanic audience 
for sure, and especially second, third generation who for the first time are seeing themselves represented in a modern way that doesn't feel stereotypical. We play a lot with Spanglish in our copy and we celebrate the richness of our culture in an aspirational way that feels global and inclusive. But then on the other hand, we have this non-Hispanic customer that is just very savvy when it comes to sustainability and clean formulas. Within a few years, Ceremonia has expanded to about 20 products. Papaya scalp scrub and guava leave-in conditioner are top sellers. We also like to just elevate everyday rituals, turning wash days into a joy instead of a chore. I think many women with textured hair, thick hair, frizzy hair, kind of like are dreading the wash day because it takes hours to dry and then you need to style it and all of these things. And we're trying to flip that script. While Baba celebrates the success of her business, raising the visibility of a vast, rich community might be what she is most proud of. This is a big moment for us. We really want to broaden people's perspective of what Latin American culture has to offer. Thanks so much, Jill. And Ceremonia just launched a brand new product called Mascarilla de Guava, a deep conditioner powered by super fruits and plants. Nice. That sounds like Try something that. you'd want to eat. I don't know. <laughs> de Guava. Nice, all nice the little dessert. There you go. All right, coming up, a special sisterhood of women who are coming together and tapping into their inner child. But this club is about much more than a playground game. We'll be right back. We are back with a story that just may motivate you to get moving. There's a sisterhood of women all over the age of 40 who regularly get together to bond and de-stress and just feel like kids again. NBC's Priscilla Thompson recently jumped at the chance to meet them. No kids. No pets. And no stress. That's part of the motto of the 40 Plus Double Dutch Club, a group of women over 40 gathering weekly to jump rope. Where's she at? Where's she go? What is the 40 Plus Double Dutch Club? Sisterhood. Most of us came for the Double Dutch and having fun with our friends, we stay for the sisterhood because that's what it's become. Pamela Robinson and Katrina Dyer-Taylor founded the group on the south side of Chicago in 2016, when Pam was going through a tough time. I felt like I was sinking. My marriage was coming to an end. My kids were growing up. They didn't need me the same way they had. I just needed to find something that was for me. After jumping double dutch at a Memorial Day barbecue, she felt something shift. It made me forget about everything that was going wrong in my life. I felt like a kid again. And that was the feeling I needed to rediscover. <laughs> then I went to Katrina's the next day and told her. What was your response? Because I knew exactly what Pamela was going through at the time. Whatever it is, I'm there. What began as seven women in a parking lot has grown into a sisterhood of nearly 200,000 with clubs in over 100 cities in the U.S. and abroad. We caught up with them at a meetup. Women from all walks of life displaying their ages proudly. What's your day like? What's finding self-care and support. I'm kind of a caregiver for a couple of people, and so I needed something to take care of myself. I just 
He's trying to learn how to do life yeah. as a mom, as a wife. I was unemployed as well. And it was just a really dark time. Miss Shirley had never jumped double dutch before. How does it feel to be out here jumping rope at 87 years old? It feels great. And they said I inspired them, but they're keeping me young. As a first timer, I have to admit, I was a little nervous to jump in. Because y'all are real skilled, but if you don't get this, I owe the whole crew dinner. But after some encouragement from the ladies, okay, what do I need to do? I was ready. Their movement has become about more than just jumping rope. <laughs> From their No Sister Left Behind Fund, which provides financial assistance to members in need, to community service for those who are in shelters and incarcerated. What impact do you think this is having? It's helping women not only to improve our physical health, but also our mental and our spiritual health as well. We have women that are dealing with grief, loss, depression. We know it's not just about jumping rope. It's really about saving lives. And it shows them that you're not alone. You're not the only one that's gone through this. You have somebody. You have a whole sisterhood now. A sisterhood. Think makes this sisterhood so strong. Good for all of us. The love that we all have, the genuineness, the authenticity of this group. It's really the love and the fellowship. We are women who are not competing with each other. We're getting together to uplift each other, to encourage each other, to inspire each other to be the best versions of ourselves that we can be. That's a fun skill. You said you grew up double dutching? I mean, on the playground. Yeah. But yeah. I wasn't good at it. Have you guys ever done it? No. I like no. doing the ropes. <laughs> it's, remember, I learned on this hour. That's right. I learned I on this that. show. So you can yeah. double dutch as well now? Because of the third hour of today. Huh. Priscilla, thank you. By the way, since our story first aired, their documentary, Beyond the Ropes, won the Audience Choice Award at the Peachtree Village International Film Festival. Oh, wow. That's in Atlanta. Right. So congrats to all of them. We'll be right back. Tomorrow on the third hour of today, a performance from country singer-songwriter John Party. Hold in, Jenna. Up next. We'll see you tomorrow, everybody. Have a great day. Today, we turn up the heat with Hot Ones host, Sean Evans. Plus, the superstar vocal coach behind our holiday song, who tried to teach Jenna and me how to sing, Cheryl Porter. And the talented TikTok artist capturing the beauty of ordinary New Yorkers in the most extraordinary way. From Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, it's today with Hoda and Jenna. It all starts right now. Hey, everybody, it is the 27th day of December. 
We're right in between Christmas and New Year's. And a whole new beginning is ahead. Mm -hmm. And Cozy. getting ready for the beginning. Yeah, hibernate a little and then break loose. Hibernate a little mm -hmm. and maybe start to think about what you want for your new year. Mm -hmm. This is around the time where I like to do that. Okay. All right, so the All Wall right. Street Journal recently didn't, they honored their innovators of the year. Yeah, so they honored people who pushed boundaries across music, film, business. Winners included Martin um, Scorsese, Scorsese yeah, SZA. SZA, Kylie Jenner, and Julie Louis Dreyfus. Now, Julie and Louis Dreyfus, we're fans of, obviously, yes. around here. She won the award for Comedy Innovator of the Year. First of all, if you've never seen Veep, just watch it on reruns or whatever it is. Watch one. Just watch one. one. It's 26 minutes. It will light, you'll laugh because it's ridiculous. Yes. It is so funny. She has comedic timing like nobody's business. She also has a special type of comedy. Yes. Don't you think? Yes. It's, fun, it's yes. funny but kind, but also like she's yes. not afraid to be physical. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, she stole the show with her acceptance speech, which she said was completely written by chat. GPT. That's, you know, when you put, you know how you do that, you put, go to the program and type in a couple of facts and then it spits out Wait, a whole I've speech. I've never done it and now I want to. Okay, well, let's see what, how hers turned out. Today is a moment of profound gratitude and reflection for me as I accept the great honor of being recognized as the investor of the year by Wall Street Journal. <laughs> Reflecting on this milestone, I am reminded of the unwavering support of my family and the unyielding dedication of my team that has been the driving force behind my investment strategies <laughs> and my performances in Aaron Brockovich, Pretty Women, and Mystic Pizza. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So, chat GPT, not so good. Yeah, but don't you love how it uses words like unyielding? I know. Like, it really is, it's, it's, it's trying, good and yet not, not good great. at all. But aren't they using it to write like resumes? And yeah, resume I'm worried and that like my kids are going to write, you know, the mm -hmm. scarlet letter English <laughs> paper that we all had to write on chat GPT. GPT. They might. Okay. All right, so it is time for tool time. Since we're talking innovation, we want to check out some innovative gadgets oh, that we've got. You. Thank, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian, for bringing our shopping cart. Shopping okay, cart. so we're going to pull a gadget out of a bag. We're going to try to guess what it what it was made for. Okay. okay. Here's this one. Okay, oh, does he, do see. these have a theme? Oh, gosh. You know what oh, this is obvious. This is this is Hope where you life. put soap in the, in the shower, clearly. It's called shoppy. It's where you put no, it doesn't open. How do you open it? It doesn't open. Oh, 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 I like it. And you push it to close. So it's a soap it's dish. Soap. Yeah. What is it? It's a salad, single handed salad server. Oh my word. Wait, wait. No Ooh, no, no, no pasta problem. salad. No Magusta no pasta salad. No problem. You just dig in, you get a big old clamp. Oh, oh you corn. can use it on. You know what? Corn. You know what else you could do? Yeah, you throw Here, trash huh? out. Thank you. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, let's get to the next one. Okay, here we go. We're kind of fascinated mm -hmm. by this snack. All right. Okay, let's see. Wait, this this is, is that yours? I don't know. Oh, it fell off mine. Too. What is this? Oh, uh, uh, wait, what? Oh, look at the three prongs it's a three on the bottom. Thing. That looks like that hurt if you poked wait, it on somebody. See. You know what it's for? No. It's for you put it in a cake. You put it in the cake and you pull it out to see if any of it, while it's baking, you know, to, to figure out if it's cooked all the way through. That's what it is. Um, actually, it is a. Condom? What? A condiment fork? Oh, you put it on the pickle. Oh, my word. Y'all, that seems like a lot of trouble when you can just stick your hand in there. <laughs> like normal people. <laughs> Don't you ever just stick your hand of in course. the pickle jar to eat the sweet pickle? Okay, we're not. No, and ours broke, unfortunately. It doesn't. Well, no, these are different sizes. Oh, for different sizes. Different cans. sizes, y'all. All right, let's bring on number okay, three. Next. Last but not least. I can't wait. Illumin. Oh, it's a light. It's a menu reader. It's a, no, it's a it's a book light. It's a menu reader. You read, you're going to a restaurant, you're no, like, oh, no, it's dark it's for, out. No, it's for your book. 
It's oh, it changes colors. Wait, what? Oh, oh, it's one of those weird things that people point. Oh, it, you got it. Green. I know what it is. What is it? It's a, a toilet, toilet light. Oh, is that so that if you go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, you can see 16 LED colors? Wow, I'm into it. I kind of think it's good for a little kid's bathroom. And they could make it pink. How did you make yours green? You just did it? How do you charge it? Uh, oh, it's solar chargeable, maybe. Wow, I like okay. it. I'm into it. Okay, that was a good one. Coming up next, the YouTube star whose unique interview style has more than a billion views. Yeah, Donna catches up with the Hot Ones host, Sean Evans, after this. It's time to spice things up a little bit. Yeah, Donna caught up with the host who has put on his own unique spin on celebrity interviews. Uh -huh. He does it so well. Sean Evans hosts the popular YouTube series Hot Ones. 21 <laughs> wow, seasons wow. and more than 300 interviews with celebs like Viola Davis, mm -hmm. your fave, Steph Curry, and Ed Sheeran. Sean definitely knows how to turn up the heat. But for our interview, we decided to cool it down. Take a look. <laughs> this is not normal. <laughs> you gotta get your head checked. It's the show known for its hot questions and even hotter wings. You're crushing it, you're doing great. But this is gonna kill me, right? Since 2015, Hot Ones host Sean Evans has been challenging his guests to eat 10 wings with progressively fiery sauces, all while asking burning questions. What role did roadside boiled peanut stands play in your life? Are you seriously trying to do this interview still? <laughs> Guests are often impressed by Sean's well-researched interviews. And he spent a week in spring training with the Dodgers back in 2010. Is there a story that stands out? So funny, not a lot of people know that uh, I did that. He's um, so excited that you just asked that question. I was so excited. <laughs> I'm gonna fight you. But the hot wings frequently lead to some heated exchanges. It's okay. It's okay. okay. Damn it! it. Who are you? Why are we here? <laughs> Nobody's ever whooped your <laughs> after all these chicken wings. <laughs> For our interview, <laughs> I decided to cool things down a bit. I met Sean at the Museum of Ice Cream in New York City, making. Sundays. Do you want any chocolate yeah, yeah, taco? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's hilarious because you're watching these celebrities writhe in pain, mm -hmm. but they come out of it praising you. Yeah, maybe it's a it's a lesson in trauma bonding or something. But I think oh, yeah, God. I've seen people challenged. I've seen people down and out. Then it becomes this emotional roller coaster that kind of makes it a thing that is kind of, I think, been the special sauce in the whole thing, or that's allowed it to last for so long, is you end up kind of really getting to know this person through this hot ones gauntlet. I'm gonna throw like a little bit of everything. Going I'm going everything. Oh, I love you know? that. Like, uh, wow, you're really trusting the process. I am. Sean, a native of Evanston, Illinois, and broadcast journalism graduate, created the show with producer Chris Schoenberger. We had an idea for a celebrity interview show, but we wanted to disrupt it. And we were like, well, how could we do that? And we shot the pilot, and we haven't stopped shooting it since. And in a way, I feel like we accidentally invented that what's it like to have a beer with this person show, you know? Hot Ones has become a cultural phenomenon, nominated for two Daytime Emmy Awards and even spoofed on SNL. Beyonce? <laughs> Sorry, I'm good. <laughs> Your girl's throat just closed up for a second, though. I want to play a game called 
Brain freeze. Oh. Where the questions are icy, not spicy. Okay. First question. Do you enjoy watching celebrities go through their painful times? Depends. There's a line <laughs> <laughs> that uh, when it crosses, I am like, I'm so sorry. You just want to curl up in the fetal position on a on a bathroom floor, you know, and like I've been there. So like when when that's going on, I'm like, I know, I know. Just just two more wings left. We're almost there. You're doing great. Which celeb has panicked the most? Pete Davidson comes immediately to mind when I think about that. Wow. <clears throat> two wings to go. <sighs> Do you ever skip a hot wing while the celebrity is taking one? No, over 300 episodes, 21 seasons, 3,000 chicken wings, and I have eaten every single one That's of them. That's amazing. Yeah. You are cleverly reactive, you're direct, you're also empathetic. What do you attribute all that to? I don't know, um, maybe there's a Midwestern sensibility, an impulse or a natural reaction to see the good in people. But overall, I'm just, I'm just an idiot trying my best. <laughs> Then, Sean joined us, remember, in studio to answer some juicy questions himself in a game we call... Hot Seat! Okay, this was so much fun. Take a look. This is how it's gonna work. I'm gonna ask you guys a juicy question related to hosting a talk show, okay. and then select one of you guys to answer it, okay? okay? If it's too juicy, instead of answering, you can pop a sour candy in your mouth. Okay. Are you ready We're to go? Ready. Come on, let's come do on, it. Sean, you're in trouble. Okay, here we okay. go. First one. Go for Sean. Name a guest you considered dateable. Hoda? Oh, simple. Before he was married or now? <laughs> um, well, Blake Shelton was definitely dateable, for sure. I mean, Who's the most recent one? Ooh. Josh Lucas. Oh, Josh Lucas. Oh, yeah. Josh Lucas. Sweet Home Alabama, so too. We're rooting hot. for you. Okay. Yes. Name a guest oh. that almost bailed on your show day, on your show day of. Sean. Ooh. Oh, we've had some people bail day of. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I've been wow. like, yeah, just there. standing there, sitting there on a set. Oh, uh, he's but, looking at the sour candies. You know, the, Do in it. the in the host game, you know, you can't bury you someone because it always someone. comes back <laughs> Yeah, do so, Oh, he's gonna uh, eat. Are oh, you right. going with a lemon ball? Well, that oh, that lemon ball looks dangerous. <laughs> okay. okay. Right, go in. Name. How is it? Oh. Sour? It's very Too sour, sour? Okay, good, He good, can handle good. anything. Wow. Yeah. He's the you thought one. he could handle everything, but turns out no, sour is his okay, okay, here we go. Let's see if you guys can handle the okay. heat. Ready? <laughs> Name the last it. project you exaggerated about watching or liking to the guest promoting it. Oh, Jenna? <laughs> 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 no, mama ain't gonna tell you that. I'm going with a Skittle, because I bet it's delicious. Okay, because it recycles. All right, here we go. Name a guest who made the most special request yeah, before just, arriving. Most special Sean, request. Sean, you know that's Oh, here. Sean, best who? Uh, I was just talking about sour. Oh, yeah. we, one more time Which with the question. Which guest has made the most special requests before oh, arriving? Mm. Oh, they, you know, as guests have gotten more famous, the milks have gotten more and more exotic. <laughs> yeah, they need different kinds like of anything milk. anything weird? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's like yeah. super weird. They, the the milks you? get super weird. Um, the craziest request, though, um, I don't know. I Everybody's got a strange rider. I'll just pop another one. All right, All right. Oh, All right last one. Double barrel. Uh, we don't have time. Oh, oh, we don't. But you know what? what? Congratulations, you all are amazing talk show hosts. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> By the way, the sour skills are they kind of good? good? Let me try one. All right, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, you can watch the Hot Ones Holiday Extravaganza now on the First We Feast. YouTube channel, and guess what? You can also check out our extended conversation on our Today YouTube channel. Oh, oh I cool. love that. That's good, Donna. Who knew we have one? Okay, <laughs> in season 23 of Hot Ones, we'll be back in January. Coming up next, guys, one of the hottest vocal coaches around, Cheryl Porter, how her unique method made her a viral singing sensation. That's coming up after this.
Every morning, get into the holiday spirit with today. We're going to spread some holiday cheer. Some added inspiration to give back this holiday season. We are launching Day's Toy Drive. Holiday gifts for everybody on the list. That is delicious. Our biggest holiday crowd I'm yet. Make today your home for the holidays. Okay, didn't we have such a great time creating our very first ever annual holiday song? Has that, no, I want to know, has that song won a Grammy yet? It, it will, there's still time. So we <laughs> wanted to reintroduce you to the woman who helped make it all happen, our very good friend and vocal coach, Cheryl Porter. Cheryl can make anyone <laughs> sound good, possibly even us. But first, take a look at her incredible story. Me, me, mama, me, me, mama, me, me, mama, me. Let me hear ya. Aside from her high ranging talents, Cheryl Porter's pink tutu, colorful earrings, and signature boxing gloves make her one of the most captivating and vibrant vocal coaches around. If someone's ever seen my videos before, I think they will be kind of confused. What is this lady doing? What's going on? Why are they making these crazy sounds? And then after a while, oh, she's teaching them how to sing. Thanks to her unique style and proven track record, the beloved vocal coach has amassed more than 29 million followers on her social channels. There's no way I would have ever thought that people would like these videos. As a child, Cheryl never imagined herself as a singer. I grew up in a single mother home. My mother was a janitress on the south side of Chicago. I didn't know that I was poor at the time. Now, looking back, I was poor. So when I wanted to sing as a kid, I was like, oh, don't sing, you know, singing is not for you. You're gonna be broke. There's no way you can make it as a singer. But the Chicago native would defy the odds. My high school choir teacher said, listen, little girl, I don't know who told you that you didn't know how to sing, but believe me, you can. And that teacher changed my life. She eventually sang her way through college on a full opera scholarship. Then she moved to Italy where she fell in love and embarked on a successful solo career. But the woman with the powerful stage presence was nervous to try her hand at teaching. I was terrified to give voice lessons because if you get the wrong voice teacher, that's the end, you can ruin people. And my husband told me, you are responsible in this life for what you do and what you don't do. So even if you decide not to do it, there are consequences. Think of all of those young singers that you could help, that you're not helping. It hit me really, really hard and I felt the weight sort of lifted off of me. Embracing that responsibility, the master singer created unique vocal exercises. One of my favorites is like, me, me, mama, moo. It's like, me, me, mama, moo, me, me, mama, me, me, mama, moo, me, me, mama, me, me, mama, moo. It's all part of the Cheryl Porter vocal method. Another one of my favorite vocal exercises that I love is called Good Morning World, and it goes, Good morning, world, how are you? I'm fine, I come to shine. So that's to help you with articulation. Keep it low in the time frame. Today, her lessons are used in schools around the globe, and she also hosts an international masterclass tour. And the sweetest part for Cheryl, her mother was able to witness her success. She passed right when I bought a home. But she got to see that house. She got to see what music did, but how the power of music and the power of dreams, how we never stopped believing in ourselves. She got to see my dream come true. Been a professional singer for 27 years, and now it's my turn and my time to give back to all of those singers, all of those dreamers who want to use their voice, and I can make a difference in that person's life. And even a little dreamer just like me can one day be on the Today Show. First of all, we love you, the little dreamer. I oh, love you guys. We love you. Thank you for having me. Oh, I feel like all your dreams are coming true, aren't they? Honey, what a blessing to be here. I grew up watching this show, and everyone told me that I would never make it as a singer. <laughs> for me to be here today talking about my story with you oh. is a dream come true. And I want everybody to know dreams do come true and oh. never stop dreaming, honey. Cheryl, when oh. we met you, oh. I yeah. mean, our, we got back to the office yeah. after working with you and it was of course your talents yeah. that radiated but it's so much more you're yes. so loving and positive you're looking you're out <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you so much, sweetheart. Of course. I mean, I, you know, Thank you. I love that you didn't let that those people yeah. say to you, you can't. That's right. That's right. So many singers all over the world battle with that because when you tell someone you want to be a singer, they say, you can't do it. Do anything else. When I told my mom that I want to be a singer, she said, you can do anything in the world but that. But that. <laughs> <laughs> and she was afraid. She was so afraid Fear. that I wouldn't be able to eat. She was afraid I wouldn't be able to take care of myself. And there's so many dreamers out there like me that have this dream and so many people they just may not understand it but when you have a dream that dream is for you not everybody's going to see your dream not everybody that's why you have it denied by yourself not everybody's going to see your dream and that's okay but keep on dreaming because dreams do come true because look at me here i am well you know you had that one teacher that one music teacher yeah. who said little girl you can sing i don't know who told you you can't yes. but you can her name was mary burns i was my just gonna teacher, ask you yes. mary burns yes in my high school morgan park high school she said little girl who told you you couldn't sing okay Wait, speaking we, of singing before you go i mean we, you're gonna stay around but yeah we before hear. we go to commercial we yeah. sing us out a little something oh my goodness yeah. it is too early to be singing but i'll try can i stand okay. up if yes, I can? Yes, yes. okay now it is so you got to stand up because we, we're going to be doing some lessons today yeah and so you have to stand up so posture is important so i'll just okay. do a little, just bit. A little bit so picky, picky, sing your that's it. That's all. Wow. Oh, cheating this morning. <laughs> we adore her. All right, when we come back, Cheryl is going to give us a singing lesson. Wait, and wait until you see how it that turned out right after this. You met the amazing vocal coach, Cheryl Porter. Okay, let's take a look back at our very first singing lesson with Cheryl. How'd we do? Check it out. <laughs> Meeting our vocal coach, Cheryl Porter, was pure joy. But could she really help us become the singers we dream of being? Jen and I both love to sing, and we don't have a ton of talent. Sir, I am to find. Oh my God. Did yeah, that sound good? No, it didn't. Um, Who's the person who can show us how to do it right? Maybe it would unlock it. Is there a magician? Yes. Because that's what we With need. With the magic wand. I think they're going to be great. I'm making my bet that they're going to kill it. And with that, it was time for class. So it goes like this. E -A -A. Noom, noom, noom. I can do the noom noom. We started with some quick warm ups like any good singer would. We're gonna shake it out. Shake it out. So take a deep breath. Perfect. Now breathe out. And this time you gotta keep the book up. Wait, how? <laughs> Back on our feet, Cheryl gave us her finest pink boxing gloves. She says they help us focus on our vocal support. Make sure you're feeling it down in the core. <laughs> <laughs> That's 
it. Ha 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 
morning. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names only on today. See, it worth coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about. Only on today. It's time now for our series, Just the Good News. New York Live entertainment correspondent Joel Gargiulo has the story of a very innovative oh, artist. Oh, yes. yes Hi, I do. Hi, ladies. Hi. Always lovely to see you. All right. Well, his name is Devon Rodriguez, and he is really someone who puts his heart into every ounce of his art. And I caught up with Devon recently, and he shared his very personal and inspiring story of resilience. Take a look. With a pencil and pad, a subway ride, and six words. I did this drawing of you. I did this drawing of you. I did this drawing of you. Devon Rodriguez changed his world, one drawing at a time. Yo, this is sick. No, thank you, buddy. I remember pulling out my phone, and I only had a, a thousand followers at that day, the first time I made a subway video. And then I look at my phone, and I have a hundred thousand. And I knocked on my grandma's door, like, I'm gonna be famous. I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna, like, everything's gonna change. Three years after going viral, he's now the world's most followed visual artist on social media, with more than 32 million followers on TikTok alone. I did this painting of you. Yeah, 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 I'm the bond. It resonates with so many people because it's not just about the art. It makes people so joyful to, to feel seen. You have been doing art since you were how old? Yeah, since I was like four, I've been doing art my whole life. On paper, you shouldn't have made it. Can you just take me back to the beginning? Yeah, oh my God, you about to make me cry. Um, we'll do it together, <laughs> we'll do it together. So it, it, was, it was wild, like, um, like my mom was very abusive to me. My dad abandoned me when I was three and, and like everybody around me was so like violent. I felt like um, I needed my art to like get, get, me, get me somewhere. So I was trying everything and it's all I know how to do. And my grandma, she like, took me when I was 14. She was like, we got to get you out that house. We got to, and when I got to her house, even just having breakfast with me was like such a shock. Like I never had breakfast in the morning. So, um, so she gave me like a nice place to stay, fed me and like always told me, focus on your art. It really ingrained in me like, you got to hustle now because you're going to be stuck in a nightmare if you don't. I was given a chance and I met Jeremy Harper. And this art teacher taught me everything I need to know. He's the one that took me on the subways to draw people. He's the one that inspired that. The reason why I went so hard on social media is because I never felt comfortable in galleries. But now that kid from the Bronx has a whole gallery to himself for his first solo exhibition, appropriately titled Underground. I want to present everyday people in a high end space and show the world like these are the people that matter to me. I captured humanity in four different countries. I did New York City, I did Paris, I did London, and I did Barcelona. Abuela, come over here. What's it like seeing all of this? Seeing your, your baby's work in this space? Muy emocional. Fuera de... Y muy grande, 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 grande. Maravilloso. What do you want everyone to know about your abuela? Even though we had no money, the love that she had for me solved a lot of issues. Last week, she sent me a photo of 5,000 cards because she went to the print shop and she stands in the Bronx passing them out saying, come to my grandson's art show. And I'm like, well, you don't really have to do that anymore. I have a couple of followers. And she's like, no, I need the Bronx there. I need our people there. She actually, she has one on her. And send you a look. Grandson. That's a grandmother who believes in their grandson so much. That's what that is. <laughs> she said, because I always listened. Not too bad for a kid from the <laughs> South Bronx. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. This is like the meaning of life when you get to inspire so many people and it changes the world. 
And I want to tell you guys a little update. All of his artwork mm -hmm. sold wow. out. Of no course. surprise. He's moved on to other projects. And of course, he took some of that money to send his abuela on vacation to go see some family Aww. members. Their bond it's is beautiful. Beautiful. Awesome. Right? beautiful. Thank you. Thank All you, right. We Joel. wish him so much success. Yeah. Coming up next, her fresh and modern wedding dress designs have made her a celebrity favorite. Donna introduces us to bridal designer Danielle Frankel. Coming up right after this. Today we are celebrating innovators and there's one designer making her mark in the wedding dress world. Adana caught up with the woman Vogue calls a go-to designer for fashion forward brides. Yeah, wow, you nice know title. I love this one. Of course. <laughs> okay, Danielle Frankel Hirsch has dressed celebs like Julia Garner, Aaron Foster, and Zoe Kravitz, but it's designing gowns for everyday women that really gets her excited. Take a look. Danielle Frankel Bridal Studio is having its moment. The creative spirit that we have here, it kind of drives the whole operation. From actresses saying, I do, to even the president's granddaughter at her rehearsal dinner. This designer's unique aesthetic has become the look of choice for fashion forward brides. The first time I saw one of your gowns and fell in love was on Erin Foster in early 2020. Mm -hmm. And Zoe Kravitz has worn um, some ear pieces. Was there one person you thought, wow, I'm on the map now? I don't know if um, I've thought about it that way. Usually when we are dressing a prominent person, it obviously feels very good, but it's the real women that we're dressing. And when I see their photos, that gets me very excited and jazzed. How do you go about understanding the vision inside the bride's mind and bringing it to life? What we do is we think about ourselves, right? What do we want to wear as real people? And that's how the designs are really developed. Danielle Frankel Hirsch is even turning heads beyond bridal. She recently designed a custom look for Beyonce during her LA stop of the Renaissance tour. All around her New York City atelier, alongside Danielle's gowns, you'll see her biggest influence, her family. Her paternal grandfather survived the Holocaust. The foundation of my family, my family's story, and coming to America and being survivors, I think that maybe the concept of love in general, strong connections are definitely thematic within my family, and I would love to say the same within my business. Actually, I work with my husband, so he's the CEO of this company. The idea of family is very important to me, and it's very much rooted in how this business was built. The label launched in 2017 after Danielle designed for Vera Wang and Marquesa. At the time, she too was a bride-to-be, engaged to her now husband, Josh. What was it like being a bride? creating bridal looks. I was able to envision what people really wanted just because I was surrounded by women who were shopping. But I think that's interesting because what you're making right. is not mainstream. Right. And that's a risk. When I look at our garments, I actually think that they would suit almost anybody because I truly see them in that way. How do you feel about the flower? I like it. 
Bride Carrie Powers went to multiple boutiques before finding the right fit in a Danielle Frankel gown. I loved that it was a little bit different, maybe a little bit for me, less traditional. As the brand continues to grow, Danielle remains true to what she does best, tapping into how a bride wants to look and feel. The brides are really going to dictate what the future of this brand looks like as well. It's really coming from them, so they are truly the inspiration behind the brand. Okay, I cannot get enough of looking at those <laughs> yes, gowns. They're beautiful. By the way, I should say um, our beautiful bride, Carrie, mm -hmm. got married since, is mm -hmm. now a happily married. And mm -hmm. also, uh, Danielle was pregnant during the interview, and she has since given birth. So she's a mom of two. A lot of happy occasions to <laughs> I was going to say, a lot, yeah. a lot of love yeah. happening there. All right, Donna, thanks. We'll be back right after this. going to do it for us tomorrow. We hope you're hungry. Yeah, we're going to get cooking with some of your favorite celebrity chefs. And Jenna and I go to Cheese Boot My camp. favorite type of boot camp. We'll see y'all manana. Bye. Bye. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William Franz Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960, or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists, and Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Dookie Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eatery is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Dookie Chase's. And I'm Edgar Duke Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Dookie Chase Restaurant. 
Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chase's as a po' boy shop, becoming a full service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase Jr., and his wife, Leah Lange Chase, that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Dookie Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china, she wanted linens, she wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution years in the making. Post-1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. There were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace. But that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall, the list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chase's when she gave African-American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time, they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, passing away on June 1st, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades. From red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la Duke. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, 
release some of those flavors. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. Gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter 4. Being a fourth generation African-American restaurant tour is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family all day, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family and it's such a joy. And that joy, best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hello. Hey, yes. Enjoying everything. Enjoying everything. It's great to enjoy everything. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie Chase to, to get, get myself my some gumbo. When, when the service is right, they treat, treat you nice. nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great-grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, Food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together. A trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, it was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trines Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, 
you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner, Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, according to Professor Psyche Williams Forson. The heart of civil rights is America because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks were in the North, they still experienced poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's, Dizzy Kalepsi, Ozzie Davis, Ruby Dee, you know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. But racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events just four years apart sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire, and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open. Nothing was open. You know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken. Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, Trinesse, wow. It's so, it's so good, good to see, see you. It's been so long. It's been mm. way too long. I've missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of 
my grandmother's favorite. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so. He, yeah. After a meal here, After yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. Executive chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's in. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you in the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, so, Sylvia used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So, did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applied a dry rub to marinate the chicken. No, is that just plain plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, yeah. See how gentle he's putting it in there? Putting the baby to bed. Yep. They'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Oh, yeah. Wow. Like I feel her, I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. You better <laughs> pick, up your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to, I'm going to try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow. That looks perfect. Now this now is you're worth, a thigh person. This is, so I, I know am what a thigh person. For. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect. Wow, the seasoning is moist, crisp. Oh. Your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this piece to go. Oh, I'm going to pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you.
Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come, great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I could come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at B&G Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and um, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here. But there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab you know, once it became popularized. But in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ate here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldred Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activists U.E.P. Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and Huey P. Newton come through the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. 
Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, man. Good to see you, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting up pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course, grits. Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward and how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now. They fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders. Ah, the avocado. From toast topping to sweet treats, even mac and cheese, this tasty green fruit is pretty much everywhere. But did you know the most popular variety, the Haas avocado, was developed right here in Southern California. So I came all the way across the country to find out how farmers and restaurant owners are making sure we're enjoying these for years to come. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We call this right here the Avocado Tunnel of Love. <laughs> In the past 20 years, believe it or not, avocado consumption has tripled in the United States. Today, the average American eats eight pounds of these babies every year. I'm at Rancho Vasquez, one of the oldest avocado orchards in the country. Here, the Vasquez family grows several different varieties. Let's avocado check it out. Oh, welcome to Rancho Vasquez. Art? Yes, Nice Art. to meet you. How's it going, sir? Damien Vasquez. Damien, nice welcome to see to you guys. Army veteran Art Vasquez has turned his love for avocados into a true family obsession. Four generations live together on this scenic ranch. Many of them work in the orchard and help run the business. I've never been to an avocado farm. Wow. So, uh, this will be gonna, a lot of fun. You guys going to give me a tour? Absolutely. All right, let's go. Art's grandfather, Refugio Morones, moved to the U.S. from Mexico in the 1920s. He picked avocados and citrus fruit on several farms, but always dreamed of having his own orchard. When Art was seven, the family purchasing their first acre of this ranch. And that's when my grandfather, Refugio, would start teaching me how to take care of the trees. That's when I, I really started loving picking. My brother and I would pick the avocados, take the avocados down to the town, knocking on doors, selling the avocados. 
Art put his passion for produce on hold to pursue a career in the auto parts industry. In 2002, he was able to buy the entire property, which was destined to be raised for new houses. We've taken it from 250 trees all the way up to 3,750 trees. This is something, a sustainable legacy that I can leave here and teach my children, grandkids, and the family how to work the earth, how to grow things organically. Art had also saved a piece of Golden State history. Avocados are native to Mexico, but some of the first avocado trees in the U.S. were planted in L.A. County in the mid-1800s. Henry Dalton, a wealthy trader who owned ranches in California, fell in love with the fruit during trips to Central America. In 1848, Henry planted the first avocado tree in Azusa. So when he moved to Los Angeles and he took over and bought Rancho Azusa, he knew there was fresh water coming from the Azusa Canyon. And so because of having the fresh water source and the awesome soil, he knew avocados would be great here. During a tour of the ranch, I got to see a living part of that history. What well, makes it special is one of the first planted avocado trees in the Western United States. This puppy is one of a kind. It's like us, Al. It's one of a kind, <laughs> okay. And it's still producing fruit? Still producing fruit. It produces anywhere between 500 to six, 700 pounds of fruit a year. Experts estimate this tree is more than 100 years old. It produces a type of avocado known as the fuerte, in Spanish meaning strong. It was the first avocado variety to thrive in the United States because it can withstand cooler temperatures. But in the 1920s, a new variety emerged in SoCal that would ultimately dominate the world market. A guy by the name of Rudolf Haas, he was actually a postal carrier, but his hobby was growing. So he had an orchard at his house about 20 miles from here, La Habra Heights. The Haas avocado was a total accident. An amateur farmer, Rudolph had purchased some mystery avocado seeds. When the tree matured, he was surprised by the dark, bumpy fruit it produced. And that really took off commercially because it has a thicker skin. So for shipping purposes, and it's an amazing tasting fruit. The Fuerte and many other avocados stay green when mature, but the skin on a Haas turns black when ripe, hiding any bruises. It didn't take off right away among consumers in the U.S. So it took a few marketing campaigns for Americans to embrace this creamy variety of the fruit. This fourth, put a little green in your red, white, and blue. Today, 80% of avocados grown worldwide are Haas. Now here, this is one of the first Haas trees commercially ever planted. We've got two Haas trees right here. Until the 90s, the majority of avocados consumed in the country were grown in California and weren't available year round. But all that changed in 1994. President Clinton made NAFTA the law today, linking the United States to Canada and Mexico in one large trading bloc. When NAFTA passed, avocados from Mexico became available everywhere, and folks could enjoy them anytime. Today, even named avocado toast a top trend of the 2010s. Avocado toast. I'm not sure how this happened, but there came a time in the past 10 years when people began to realize that their lives were not complete without it. Thanks to clever campaigns, new diet trends, and an abundant supply, avocado consumption has boomed in the last two decades, growing into a multi-billion dollar industry. Now, 90% of those avocados come from Mexico. However, this has led to major environmental impacts like deforestation. Rancho Vasquez wants to combat the negative effects of monoculture farming. As an organic orchard, they follow strict guidelines to help protect the land. How have the trees and what you grow tried to lessen the impact on the environment? We pick the weeds by hand. Are we weedy? Because it's all organic. Yeah. So we don't ever spray any weed killer or anything like that. The deer come and eat all the lower leaves and skirt the trees for us. Ah. And they turn that into natural manure. Now, when it comes to picking, avocados require a gentle touch. So we still do it the same high-tech way they did it 100 years ago. Wow. You and this is my grandfather's pole? pole right here. Really? Yeah, this is one of the old school ones. So you can pick any of these you want. Okay. 
So yeah, you just slide it right up till the avocado goes in the basket, and then you pull on the rope. There you go, you're almost there. Pretty different, you're doing pretty darn yeah. good, you know? A little bit further, and then pull the rope. There you there go, you is. got it. <laughs> good job. <laughs> He's ready to catch. Ta-da! There you go, My that's first a nice avocado. one, too. It's gonna take a week to a week and a half right now to ripen and let it get soft. How about going and tasting some? Yes, sir, we picked some about a week or so, so they'd be perfect for you. All right, let's do it. Believe it or not, there are more than 400 varieties of avocados. Rancho Vasquez in Azusa, California sells six. The Fuerte, Hass, Lamb Hass, Reed, Pinkerton, and Gem. Each has a different shape, taste, and growing season. I've never seen such a, like, a round avocado. The ranch's avocados are prized by chefs and customers for their high oil content. That comes from the area's climate, nutrient-rich mountain soil, and secret farming techniques that have been passed down for generations. The higher the oil content, the better the tasting fruit is. Yeah. And then the longer it'll stay green. You can taste and see the difference with their organic hass. It just keeps it well, really You can literally fresh. see the oil coming out of it. Yeah, so if you want to try just a little chunk, we'll give you a little chunk. Oh, that's great. Next up, the family favorite. Fuerte. Oh, a, a real, really a different flavor. Absolutely, absolutely. There's almost, it's almost like a saltiness and a creaminess in there. Aside from his wife's guac, Art's favorite way to eat avos is actually with honey. Ooh. It's called avocado dulce, which is avocado candy. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's fantastic. Isn't it great? I would have never thought of that. Guys, this is just amazing. What does it mean for both of you to to be owners of this of this legacy. This is a legacy I do want to leave. My family, my grandkids, Damien, and this will be around for, I'm hoping and praying, for at least another 100 years, you know? And what does it mean for you, Damien? Oh, it's like you said, just a place where history can keep going. Because the trees were here before us, and they're gonna be here after us, so we're just kind of stewards of the land in the meantime. Let's share a little of this guacamole. Yes, sir. Yep. Let the chips fall where they may, as long as they've got guacamole on them.
Avila's El Ranchito is a Southern California staple that's been in business for more than half a century. They've got 13 locations and counting of this family-run chain, but no two restaurants are exactly the same. Every Avila's owner puts their own spin on the family's traditional Mexican recipes. But here at the Seal Beach Outpost, they claim to have the best guacamole. So I've come to learn their secrets. It's time to guac and roll. Hey there, wow, got a lot of folks here. The aunts, uncles, siblings, and cousins behind Avila's El Ranchito really treat their guests like family. This location is run by Elise Avila Smith, a third generation restaurateur. She credits the family's success to her grandma Margarita's hospitality. You know, she just focused on really what we focus on good, fresh food. Salvador and Margarita, or Mama Avila, immigrated from Mexico to the U.S. in 1958. How did they get into the restaurant business? My father had an opportunity to buy a restaurant and talked to my mother and decided, you know, this is a great opportunity. Salvador using his life savings to purchase the old restaurant property in Huntington Park. He turned to his six kids, including Elise's dad, Victor, for support. We would go after school and help them do whatever needed to be done. And my father was pretty much during the day taking care of the whole restaurant, and my mother was in the kitchen. So she was in the only one in the kitchen. And then, Grandpa Polder was well, washing yeah. dishes. Mama's traditional recipes have been passed down through many generations. They've come from way, way back in Mexico. When it first opened in 1966, Avila's was the only Mexican restaurant in the mostly white neighborhood. Many customers had no interest in Mama's traditional dishes, so she developed a strategy to draw people in. It seemed like natural for my mother to offer the people whatever they wanted, so mm. it was more like a home. If they didn't have it on the menu, then my mother would go in the kitchen and make it anyway. Over the next three decades, the Avila siblings opened six new restaurants in Southern California. This expansion wasn't a coincidence. Americans at the same time were falling in love with Mexican food. In the early 80s, there were an estimated 2,500 Mexican restaurants in the U.S. Today, there are more than 60,000. I was busting tables here as a child. <laughs> Elise witnessed that growth as a kid, watching her dad expand the family business. So I grew up doing homework in a booth. On top of that, I grew up with my grandparents living one street over from me. So I grew up cooking with her for years and years. After college, Elise tried working in other fields, but she was always drawn back to the restaurants. I'd be working by day, you know, I worked for a magazine. And then my brother opened his first restaurant and I ended up serving tables at night. So no matter what I did, I kept ending up back in this business and I loved it. I realized that this was my passion, it's in my blood. How do you qualify to open up a, an abla? Well, it's process, let me tell you. <laughs> Is it really? I had to work every position in the restaurant. So I washed dishes, I worked in the kitchen for a few years, but I've done it all. After proving herself for a decade, Elise opened her own Avila's in 2015. When I first opened my restaurant, I worked for several months from about six in the morning till midnight. And finally, I remember my dad and my brother came in for an intervention and said, you need to go home. You gotta sleep. <laughs> you gotta sleep. So I went home and they ran my restaurant for the night. And I knew with my dad and my brother here, there was nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. Every Avila's restaurant is unique, reflecting the family member who owns it and the location. They have different decor and specialty menu items. Elise puts her own spin on the brand by offering an extensive tequila cocktail menu. Dad, I'm gonna make you a drink right now. Make it strong. <laughs> Salute, mija. Mm. But there are several dishes you're gonna find at every location. Avocados are crucial to many of the family recipes, including the signature guacamole and their beloved chicken soup. Tell me right. about Mama Avila's soup. That soup that feels like home to me, but it is a chicken breast and rice soup. We make it from scratch every morning, including the broth. We put fresh avocado, cilantro, onion, and tomato in it. And people go, and the first thing they do when they get off the plane is go to have some chicken soup. You mentioned avocado goes into the soup. Tell me about the importance of avocado. It's part of our culture. Bottom line is nobody wants to eat Mexican food without avocado and some guacamole. <laughs> so I'm curious, first you, Victor, what's the secret to a good guacamole? You have to make it, you know, almost really as on a daily basis, almost an hourly basis. 
It needs to be fresh. It needs to be well seasoned. And a little bit of love. I like to think I make a good guac, but I, <laughs> I'm sure I can learn from the best. So how about showing me how you guys do guac? Before making some guac, I enjoyed a cucumber margarita and got a taste of Mama's famous soup. That's great. I would never think about avocado in chicken soup. Oh my God. I can't take credit for that one, Al. That's all grandma. <laughs> all right, you ready to make some guacamole? You bet. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna dump some fresh garlic in here. Okay. This is a traditional mocha hete. From there, you're gonna sprinkle a little bit of salt just on top. Just a little bit of salt. Just a little bit of love. And then you're gonna use the top to go ahead and grind it in there. A mocha hete, a Mexican mortar and pestle, is made from volcanic rock. And it's the family secret to great guac. The rough surfaces help crush the ingredients, releasing their natural oils better than chopping them up with a knife. And we're gonna get in some fresh avocado. All right. And then you go ahead and mix that together. And now you gotta be gentle with the oh, avocado soft. With, with some be love. Gentle, gentle. In go diced onions, lots of cilantro, and a good squeeze of lime juice. Keep on mixing there, and you got yourself some good, fresh guacamole. I'm gonna dig in here with you too, Al. Mm. Oh yeah. You make good guacamole, Al. <laughs> I've learned from the best. Elise, to be part of something like this, what, what does it mean? Honestly, I feel compelled to keep these beautiful recipes that are from, gosh, my great-great-grandparents running so that everyone that comes to our restaurant is able to taste them and to sit at our table and feel like family and just be a part of ours. Cheers. The ceviche bar a little different from a, a sushi bar. It's like a sushi bar, but more Mexican. Uh huh. <laughs> this lively food court is home to several family-owned hidden gems. In fact, here you'll find Holbush, a modern eatery renowned for its sustainable seafood. The chef behind this vibrant menu pairs flavors from his childhood in Mexico with the freshest of California fare. Gilberto Satina never thought he would dedicate his life to cooking but his summers spent on the Yucatan Peninsula would later inspire a bold move. Since I was a teenager, growing up in a coastal region, I would go diving with my cousins. We would dive down for octopus, uh, we'd get lobsters, we'd get sea snails, and then he would take that back and cook it. And that was one of the first times that I felt a direct connection to food because even back then, there was a disconnect, you right. know? Food came from the supermarket. And it was the first time I saw something that was like directly from the sea and you can cook it and eat it right away. So that kind of blew my mind. Gilberto immigrated to the U.S. when he was five years old. His father, Gilberto Sr., a former civil engineer, worked various restaurant jobs to support the family. How did your family transition from that kind of grassroots sort of food service to right. a real formal restaurant? It, it really was through the help of the nonprofit that, you know, operates Mercado La Paloma. This bustling market 
is run by Esperanza, or HOPE, a nonprofit dedicated to revitalizing South Los Angeles and helping first-time business owners. They gave us small business training, basic you know, restaurant health department training. They co-signed loans so my dad could purchase the equipment. It was my dad's dream to have a restaurant that represented our Mexican food, the food of the Yucatan, which is very distinct from other regions of Mexico. In 2001, Gilberto Sr. opened the family's first restaurant, Chichen Itza. The menu featuring traditional dishes like conchinita pibil, salbutes, and panuchos. Lo empezamos la mamá de Gilberto y yo, o sea, mi esposa y yo. El, al principio éramos dos personas nada más. They needed help, but Gilberto was reluctant to join the family business. I didn't want to cook. I didn't want to be in the kitchen because I, I grew up in a household where we always, you know, cooking was always used to make ends meet, like a lot of, you know, immigrant families. So when we opened the restaurant and my dad asked me to come along and help him out for six months, I was front of the house. Slowly I just discovered the cooking and that I enjoyed it and, you know, started learning from my dad. Even without formal training, Gilberto quickly learning the ropes, becoming a savvy businessman. Ten years in, Chichen Itza was thriving with dozens of employees. They even released a cookbook. Con el paso de los años, finalmente empezó a sentir la misma pasión que yo tenía por el negocio. After taking over at Chichen Itza, Gilberto was ready for a new challenge, one inspired by those summer boat trips in Mexico. Where does the name Holbox come from? So Holbox is a place. It's an island off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. He wanted to bring tropical, fresh from the sea vibes, along with an elevated experience, to diners in South Los Angeles. When Holbosch opened in the same market, it changed many perceptions of what Mexican food could be. We go outside of the realm of Yucatan and we do food from all different coastal regions of Mexico. Gilberto's fusion dishes allow the freshest fish to shine. Menu staples include seasonal ceviches and an octopus taco. His innovative cooking has wowed locals and critics alike. How does it feel to be nominated for a James Beard Award for this? Mm. After the shock, I think the first thing that I felt was extreme pride in my team. To a certain level, I guess it feels a little bit like validation because we're doing something slightly outside of the box. You look across Mexican cuisine and, and one of the commonalities is the avocado. Why does the avocado work so well across cuisines in Mexico, but especially your cuisine? The pairing of avocado goes extremely well with raw seafood preparations like ceviches and cocktails, and they're very bright, light, and acidic. I think avocado is the perfect complement because it gives it a little bit, you know, creamy richness. That delicate balance is best represented in the shrimp and scallop aguachiles. And I couldn't wait to try making it. So aguachile is super simple. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take, we're gonna make a marinade that's gonna cook or denature our scallops, right? So we're just gonna take some, some cilantro. Uh -huh. Next up, the chili. Serrano peppers bring the heat. Persian cucumbers cool it down. There's a pinch of salt, ice to prevent oxidation, and a squeeze of lime juice. Then the marinade blends for just about a minute. Now, we're just gonna take a bowl. Go ahead and put a couple of uh, spoonfuls of these beautiful Baja California Bay scallops. Ooh, look at those. Now, we're gonna pour the marinade and hold on to the spoon for a stirring. Perfect, that's about right. We wanna let that marinate for at least five minutes. Gilberto takes his agua chile to the next level with an avocado rose. After pitting and peeling, it was time to get slicing. Your knife can be straight because your avocado is at an angle, and we're pull oh. cutting. You're just gonna do this, Al. Huh? Look. Okay. The key to a great rose? Super thin slices. We're hiring, you know. <laughs> okay. Now the next step. Hands, right? This we're gonna do this this motion. We're gonna fan out the okay. avocado, right? Okay. So can you see that? Oh wow. Go. Looking good there. I think that's uh, good enough to roll. You're gonna start at the tip right here, okay. and you just roll this one like that. You see how that's 
forming a really big flower. Yes. This is a pretty advanced skill, yeah. but I think it's one worth practicing. Oh yeah. And it's a nice party trick, you know? Sure. Impress your friends. Yeah. So, which one should we use? <laughs> that one. Made by the professional. Time to plate it up. That's looking beautiful. You're a lot neater doing this than I am. I'll yeah. take like a spoonful of them and just yeah. drop it on there and then arrange them on the plate. Ah, pro tip. And of course, the finishing touches. Wow. That is our scallop agua chile. And I help make it. Can something this pretty taste as good as it looks? Mm, that looks like a good bite. Mm. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you, I'm glad you enjoyed it. But yet so simple. Thank you, sir. Al, oh, it was a pleasure. Fantastic. The Haas avocado may have started out as a lucky surprise, but for decades, its popularity has been no accident. The Mexican-American culinary traditions passed down through the years have made this delicious and nutritious fruit a staple for so many of us across the country. And thanks to generations of enterprising families, this bumpy green fruit is going to have a very long shelf life. New York City is home to so many iconic foods. But when the city that never sleeps wakes up for breakfast, they want a bagel with a cream cheese schmear piled high with locks. There's no other city that makes a bagel like it a New York City bagel. I have not had good bagels in any other city. I came out the wounds eating bagels. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. If New York's known for anything, it's its bagels. And of course, you can't have them without a schmear. While the bagel first came from Poland, many food historians say its pairing with salmon and cream cheese originated right here in the Big Apple. In this town, few specialty food shops are as beloved and as historic as Russ and Daughters. I've been waiting in line probably 15, 20 minutes, but it's definitely worth it. I like the, the contrast of the flavor. It's like a nice little bagel with a with salty locks. I about the salmon and cream cheese together. Like I try to make it at home, but it's nothing compared to Russ and Daughters. They've been serving premium smoked fish to hungry New Yorkers and folks from around the world for over 100 years. Just a few blocks from the store is the Russ and Daughters Cafe. Hi, Al. Hey, Hello. how are you? Welcome to the Russell Daughters Cafe. Nice to see it's you. It's great guys. to have you here. Thanks for having us. This is beautiful. Thank you. Nikki Russ Fetterman and Josh Russ Tupper are the grandchildren of the original daughters. These cousins are fourth generation owners carrying on their family's culinary legacy. So, this is Russ and Daughters. Wow. This is our great grandfather, Joel Russ, who started the business his wife, Bella, and his three daughters. Um, we, Josh and I have the same grandmother, and she was the youngest of the three. Was it unusual at that time for you, because you usually would see so-and-so and sons, yeah. but to see Russ and daughters. Very unusual. But I mean, honestly, if he had had sons, it probably would have been Russ and sons. Well, thank like, goodness he did. We like exactly. to think of him as a feminist, but he was a good businessman. Joel Russ immigrated from Poland in 1907. And he started just standing on the streets of the Lower East Side selling schmaltz herring out of a barrel. And a family could feed itself for two nights with one fish. In 1914, he opened his first brick and mortar shop, J. Russ National Appetizing. Joel and his wife had three daughters, Patty, Ida, and Anne. When they turned 11, each daughter began working with their dad. What was their relationship like with him? I, because I, he's your dad, but he's also your boss. your boss. Yeah, and I think he cared more about being the boss and the shopkeeper. He was a new immigrant to this country who was just trying to survive and make a place for his family. And that was his focus. And he saw his children as, as you know, 
cheap labor. The sisters grew up learning all aspects of the business. In 1935, Hattie, Ida, and Anne became Joel's partners. The shop was renamed Russ and Daughters, making it the first in America to bear and daughters in its title. When your great-grandfather decided to, to start Russ and Daughters, why the Lower East Side? After Ellis Island, this was the starting off point for the majority of poor Jewish immigrants. This is where they landed and they got their start. And so he was just feeding basic food to other poor immigrants like himself. At the turn of the century, this neighborhood was one of the most densely populated places on the planet. Many immigrants from all around the world lived in overcrowded tenement buildings, the conditions having a profound impact on their diets. One of the things about Lower East Side Jewish food is that a lot of food wasn't made at home. When you don't have running water or when you don't have uh, electric or gas stoves, it's really hard to do very much cooking. And so for, for women who are responsible for feeding their families, they had to get food from push carts, from restaurants, from bakeries. Joel Russ was one of many vendors catering to this new population. I've, I've always been curious, how did it come about, or from what you've heard, that somebody thought, hey, you know, here's this round bread, we'll put some fish on it, but oh, by the way, before we do, let's put some cream cheese, some dairy on it. Yeah. First of all, Russ and Daughters is the torchbearer of what's called appetizing. And this is a food tradition born here in New York, and it's the sister food tradition to delicatessen, both of which come up through the Jewish kosher dietary rules. You have to separate fish and dairy from meat. So a delicatessen, strictly speaking, is for meat. The appetizing store is where you go for fish and dairy, things like herring, smoked fish. When we say bagel and lox, most people are, you know, we're referring to a smoked salmon, but sure. the original bagel and lox was not with smoked salmon. Technically, lox, or belly lox, is salmon cured in salt, which preserves fish without refrigeration. There's no smoking involved, and it's incredibly salty, so it pairs perfectly with tangy cream cheese. But who was the first person to put lox on a bagel? So no one really knows how bagels, lox, and cream cheese all came together. We know that bagels come from Eastern Europe. We know that lox kind of comes basically from Nova Scotia, kind of. We know that cream cheese is an American food. But what we know is that these things come together as part of a compromise between different generations of American Jews. Jewish law prohibits cooking with most heat sources on the Sabbath. So the combo of bagels and lox created a filling meal for observant Jews to enjoy on the day of rest. It's good for a family, but you or your daughter-in-law didn't have to be spending the, the previous day cooking. As one of the country's oldest appetizing stores, Russ and Daughters has been serving kosher meals for generations. And the weekends are still their busiest days. I can't think really of th anything that's more New York than lox and bagels. I agree. I think that this is a food that came up through the Eastern European Jewish immigrants to New York. But now it's it transformed and just become New York food. It belongs to all New Yorkers.
In the United States, women own less than 20% of all businesses. At the iconic Russ and Daughters, co-owner Nikki Russ Betterman is building on the legacy of her grandmother and great aunts. Growing up, you, you follow in the footsteps of, of strong women who may not have chosen this, but took it on and obviously made it really successful. What is it like for you following in those footsteps? It's a tremendous feeling to be now the and great-granddaughter. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a good customer of ours. Her family came from the Lower East Side. And she once said that before she knew the word feminist, when she looked up at the sign, Russ and Daughter, she understood that women could have an impact. Your family's business, Russ and Daughter, has survived two world wars, a depression. You're here in the, the shadow of the World Trade Center. Yes. Why has this place been able to not just survive, but thrive? I think because in each generation there has been someone who wanted to do this. This is food that people turn to for comfort in hard times. And during the pandemic, we saw that you know people were shipping Russ and Daughters all over the country to their loved ones because they couldn't be together. And so sending, you know, bagels and locks and babka, say, you know, I love you, I miss you. Here, let me feed you. Having a schmear over Zoom. Oh, there was a lot of that. <laughs> okay, so you can get smoked fish pretty much everywhere these days, but not quite like this. The salmon sold at Russ and Daughters is prized for its high fat content. From the milder Gaspe Nova, to the smokier Scottish. And this gourmet fish is all sliced by hand. When you hold it up, I mean, it's it's almost translucent. That. Yeah, I think we should show you how we get at that then. Yeah, me and a sharp utensil, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> it takes up to six months of training to master the slicing technique here. So, Al, I hear you have some knife skills. Well, I've been in a fight or two, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, probably nothing like yours. So how, how long have you been slicing salmon? I've been at the store for 20 years. Wow. Um, so I've been slicing for a while. All right. So, so uh, I watch people slice, and I, uh, I'm amazed at, at how patient, because it seems like that's part of the, the skill. The reality is when you know how to slice, mm -hmm. it is one of the most relaxing things you can do. Very zen. Very zen. Ooh. Meditative, right? Mm. The trick is don't look anywhere on the fish. You have to really feel the fish. Be the fish. Be the fish, which is a very difficult concept to train yeah, someone. Good. Um, and particularly the first couple slices mm. are, don't be upset okay. if they don't look great. The idea is to make a consistently thick slice. Are you making so, faces at me? No, I'm just watching you not watch the fish. <laughs> All right. Okay. Here we go. Be the fish. Not looking. You should. You should look. I should. You look. You got a sharp knife in your hand, Al, and you can see that as you change the angle of the knife, it changes the thickness. Yeah. Right. So now that's drastically a very, more that's than a, you think. That's more than. Oh my gosh, that's a very thick. We call slice. those chuletas. Chuletas. Yeah. Chops. Ah. In Spanish. I was going to say that sound. That, that didn't sound <laughs> Yiddish. Not, not that Yiddish. Did not sound not Yiddish, Yiddish to me. No. Does. The way you cut it affect the taste of it or the texture of it? The texture, which uh, affects the experience of the salmon. It's almost like you're eating the essence of salmon, not salmon. It's very delicate. It's a very appealing mm -hmm. texture and, and mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thinner. Josh, thanks so much. Nice meeting you. Such a pleasure to have you. Ah, smoke them if you got them. Up next, how fresh salmon gets turned into lots.
I'm here at the Acne Smoked Fish Factory. Now there is something fishy going on in there and you better believe I'm gonna find out what it is. The folks at Acme process, smoke, and pack nearly eight million pounds of fish every year. They sell to eateries all over the country, including Russ and Daughters. It smells of smoke and it smells of fish. That's the way it's supposed to be. It smells right. like New York City. Yes. All right, so as you know, in any food, food plant, food safety is uh -huh. of paramount importance. Right. I see you got your boots on I here. just happen to be wearing these. Awesome. <laughs> I'll walk you through the process of how salmon turns into smoked salmon. Adam Kaslow is the fourth generation owner of Acme Smoked Fish. His great grandfather, Harry Brownstein, started selling fish after immigrating from Russia to Brooklyn. Wow. Harry started in the smoked fish business in the early 1900s, in 1906 to be exact. Out, he of, went, out of a push cart? Out of a, 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 a horse drawn wagon. Wow. He would go around buying fish from different smokehouses throughout Brooklyn and Queens and had himself the sales route. You know, he worked close to 45 years. I mean, his dream was to open up his own smokehouse, and it took him 45 years to finally achieve that. Wow. Adam now runs a massive smoked fish empire, supplying many of New York City's popular bagel shops, from H&H &H to Essa Bagel. Acme also selling to national grocers, like Trader Joe's. At the end of the day, uh -huh. it's all about the fish. We bring in fish from all over the world. Uh -huh. Smoked salmon is probably the most popular thing that we make, and our salmon come from different places, Norway, Scotland, Chile, and Alaska. It can take up to five days to make smoked salmon. Every order is made to the buyer's taste, from the type of salmon to the curing method. The first step? cutting a whole fish into fillets. Whoa! Yeah, so this is a 12 kilo whole salmon Jeez. that I caught over here in Long Island Sound. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is an Atlantic salmon, uh -huh. it's farm, farm raised. We use Atlantic salmon because it has the, the most fat and fat equals flavor when making smoked, smoked salmon. Right, so what are you cutting out the, like the backbone there? Yeah, just do your bone. Uh-huh. Carving into a fish this size requires expert hands. After the fish is filleted, it's preserved with salt. The fish is then treated with a wet brine or a dry cure. Okay, so let's dry, dry cure some, some salmon. Good. First thing, we're gonna get it onto the uh, raft. Okay. okay. So, see if you can pick up this salmon, grab it by the, by the, the tail. Okay. Grab with your other hand. Okay. And we're gonna lay it onto this the, the screen. Okay. Perfect. Great. Step two, we're gonna grab a handful of salt. So it's just a thin layer. Yep. Right along the top of the dorsal. Like kind of down the center line, I suppose. And we'll Give it a nice love, love tap. That's it? That's it. This fish is rather large. So traditionally, we would probably draw a wet brine uh -huh. this, this fish. But for smaller fish, the, the dry cure lasts about 24 hours. OK. That's a huge fish. Right. After curing, the fillets are cold smoked for up to 20 hours. This process imparts a subtle, smoky flavor. Let me show you how the smoker works. So, these are a collection of that wood chip blend that we were uh -huh. talking about earlier. There are different ways to smoke fish fillets. Hot smoking results in flaky, opaque fillets. Unlike traditional lox, smoked salmon is cold smoked below 85 degrees. This helps the fish retain its silky texture and makes it perfect for slicing. Ready to help me get this bad boy into the you oven? You bet. All right. All right. Hey now. Let's close her up. Woo! 
Run her down. After the smoker, the fish is cooled, then packed for shipping. What would your great grandfather say if he could see all of this? I think he'd be amazed at how difficult it was for him to achieve his dream. Right. And now his descendants have been able to build upon that dream and build us into one of the preeminent smokers in the U.S. Up next, a vegan deli taking on tradition with plant-based lox and cashew cream cheese? Oh, you don't want to miss this. Side, two sisters, inspired by their Jewish heritage, are on a mission to make the food they loved growing up in a more sustainable way. Ladies, nice to meet you. Nice to meet Boom. you. Boom, want to show me around? Please, come Play, on in. Lead away. Erica and Sarah Kaberski are the co-owners of Orchard Grocer, an entirely vegan market inspired by classic delicatessens. This is our healthy cashew cream cheese. They want to make the vegan lifestyle easier for all. Right after college, they opened their first business, a shoe store called Moo Shoes. We opened our vegan shoe store 20 years ago. How are they? They're comfortable? About five years ago, we decided that we were going to update it by adding our vegan grocer, basically because it seemed like that's what our customers want. Um, after asking us what our shoes were made of, probably where should I go eat was um, the second most common question. So we decided to create an experience where they could just go eat next door. Growing up in Queens, the sisters' Jewish culture and food were closely linked. They had 10 Jewish delis in their neighborhood alone. Probably every Sunday, it's a tradition in our family, dozen bagels um, at the bagel store. A dozen always meant 15. I don't know <laughs> why that was, but and uh, with the cream cheese and lox, and that was just uh, how we spent our Sundays. Both sisters became vegan as teenagers, but felt they lost a piece of their roots by giving up certain foods. I think our parents were supportive of our changes to the vegan lifestyle. We grew up in a very culturally Jewish household, so all of our traditions were just based around food. Today, a lot of folks are going vegan for a variety of reasons, from reported health benefits to concerns over animal welfare. For the sisters, it's also a matter of global importance. You know, we're watching climate change happen right now, and I think that's causing a lot of people to think twice about what they're eating and how they are contributing. So it makes sense to us that it is becoming so mainstream. In 2017, Sarah and Erica saw not just an opportunity to satisfy a growing market, but to pay homage to their Jewish roots. We wanted to have a, a good sandwich selection that really epitomizes like New York deli food so obviously a bagel and mox was going to be there orchard grocer sells a variety of vegan sandwiches including rubens and tuna melts but the sisters are most passionate about serving up a sense of nostalgia people are so worried about giving things up so i think just creating those alternatives and 
just something that people are familiar with and gives them that feeling of home. Yeah, like we haven't had to give up our Sunday tradition of um, bagels and lox. To help make their unique deli a reality, the sisters hired vegan chef Nora Vargas. Nora shares a passion for plant-based foods. She also knows how to turn carrots into salty locks. How did you come up? I mean, you have to think, okay, what can mimic uh, mm -hmm. a smoked salmon? Yeah. Uh, so how did you, was it look like, like you yeah. thought, well, the only orange vegetable out there, <laughs> exactly. other than a sweet potato, <laughs> is carrot. We know the texture that we need to go for. We know the flavor that we want to go for. So we started with the color and then we just kind of built it from there. Okay, so let's get started. I'm, I'm really fascinated. Okay, by all right, I'm excited. So we have prepared, what do we have, maybe 10 pounds of carrots here wow. for you. These are huge. These would have been huge carrots. Seriously, yeah, like wow. the size of my forearm. But you <laughs> you have you have sliced them very thin on a mandolin? Yes, yeah, okay. exactly. All right, so we're all gloved up and we are going to, the next step in this process is to uh, apply our rub okay. to our carrots. So in here we have a mixture of sugar, salt, and the rest I can't tell you about. Oh, it's a secret exactly. kind of thing. So yeah. this this would be kind of like the brine that you would mm -hmm. use, the dry brine that you would use yes. on fish. Exactly. Except yeah. it's going on vegetables. Yeah. We got our inspiration for a lot of different components of this recipe from the way that you would actually prepare fish if we were preparing fish and not carrots. Right. Coat everything. Hmm, interesting. Oh no, don't smell it. Don't, don't figure out the secret just I'm, by smelling I'm, it. Okay, now. Because if I figure it out, she's gonna have to kill me. <laughs> so I'm just gonna start rubbing, just smushing everything in there. Once we get everything coated, we would let this sit for three to six hours, mm -hmm. probably. Okay, great. So I think we've, I think we nailed it. Okay. In here. It's another secret ingredient? Definitely. Jeez, yeah, a, but I can tell you. A lot of secrets here at Orchard. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit. Okay. Okay. So it's a combination of olive oil mm -hmm. and aquafaba. Aquafaba? Yeah. Are you familiar with that ingredient? I don't know. You know when you're opening up a can of beans right. and you got to drain them? Yes. The stuff that you drain out, that's aquafaba. Aquafaba. It's, like, it's bean water. It's bean, bean juice. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to pour, okay. and then you can kind of do the same process. Okay, that we same did before. process. Just squish it all in there, okay? Yeah, perfect. After we had let our carrots sit for three to six hours, right. um, we tossed them in the oven. So they bake. We like to call it cold smoking just ah. to sound like classy. Um, like the process of making smoked salmon. Exactly, yeah. That okay. does look very much like smoked salmon. <laughs> and what would a bagel and lox be without the cream cheese? This vegan spread is made with raw cashews, salt, some secret spices, and coconut oil, all blended together with soft tofu. Should we make a bagel? Sure, let's do it. Talk. This is a really terrific idea. Thank I'm, you. Thank you for opening my eyes. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. That yeah. was fantastic. Like it was a great way to finish things up. I mean, we've, we've seen the history, we've gone to the past, we were in the present, and you have brought us the locks and bagels of the future! <laughs> A bagel with cream cheese and smoked salmon is a uniquely American combination. Born from Jewish roots, transformed by local ingredients, and carried on by new generations, this breakfast tradition has truly stood the test of time when it comes to food in New York City. When most of us think about Detroit, Motown, car manufacturing, even sports comes to mind. But when it comes to food, the folks here in the Motor City are all about one famous Frank, the Coney Dog. And no, we're not talking about Coney Island in New York. In Michigan, a Coney is both a diner to locals and a hot dog smothered in chili, topped with onions, and finished off with a <laughs> of mustard. Now, there are dozens of Coneys in the Detroit metro area. Some bear the Coney Island name, others don't. But you'll always find some type of sausage, a bun, and a signature meat sauce on the menu. So 
What makes Michigan crazy for Coney's? Let's find out. The relationship be between Coney's and Detroit, it's a long relationship. It's a long love story. <laughs> the Coney is, is a part of Detroit. If you can drive and eat a Coney, it's not a Detroit-style Coney, in my opinion. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. Welcome to Detroit. What do you say we travel back in time to the earliest days of the Coney? The folks at American Coney Island have been dishing up this local specialty for more than 100 years. In fact, this restaurant and the one next door, well, they've got a shared history. But American has been run by the same family for three generations. Founded by a Greek immigrant, this restaurant story is synonymous with the legendary hot dog of this city. What do you say we go meet the family? One to go plain, one fry. At American Coney Island, hot dogs aren't just a meal, they're memories. Grace Kiros is the third generation owner of this legendary spot. Grace. Al. Hi, good to see you again. It's been a long time. It has. We sat down to talk Coney traditions, turning points, and of course, toppings. People are very passionate about their Coney Island hot dog. Here. Yes, they are. Why? Because it holds a nostalgia and a tradition to them. We see daily generations of people coming in here. Remember grandpa bringing them, my mom brought me. It, it's part of their growing up, it's part of their life. 30 years ago, Grace took over the restaurant reins from her dad, Chuck Kiros. Chuck inheriting the business from his father, founder Constantine Kiros, AKA Gust. Your place, this place on this corner, has been here for 105 years. What is it like being really part of the fabric of, of an iconic city like Detroit? It's surreal. I mean, I think back to my grandfather and my dad and the things they saw here from, from riots to Tigers winning the World Series when they were good. Such a deep history and, and proud. Mm -hmm. I love this city. The Coney craze in Detroit is really a legacy of the Kiros family. Historian Joe Grimm co-writing the book on Coney's in the Motor City. The Kiroses came to Detroit from Dara in Greece, where this was a sheep herding town, and they needed to find work. And they really struck gold, as in the color of mustard, when they started making these Coney Island hot dogs. In the late 1800s, Greece was facing a massive economic crisis setting off a wave of global migration. By 1920, it's estimated that over 400,000 Greeks immigrated to the United States seeking new opportunities. Like most European immigrants of the era, they passed through New York before moving on to other parts of the country. They entered, most of them, through Ellis Island, which is near Coney Island. They saw people on Coney Island and in New York eating hot dogs and said, ah, we're gonna go into the hot dog business, but we're gonna top it with something Greek now, the true origins, like who invented the Coney dog, lost to history. It just sort of happened in a lot of places in about the same time, mostly by Greek immigrants. Gust and his brother, Bill Kuros, opening one of Detroit's first Coney shops in the early 1900s. A family rift caused the brothers to split, leading to side-by-side -side Coney operations and a long-lasting restaurant rivalry. Detroiters swearing allegiance to American or Lafayette, but only American is still owned by the Kiros family today. We figure well more than 100 Coney Islands can trace their lineage directly to that flat top grill. Each Coney spot in the Detroit area and throughout Michigan has its own history, from national to Kirby's to Nicky D's, from Berkeley Coney Island to L. George's to Leo's and more. But all of the city's Coney's have a similar foundation, starting with a steamed bun. You add a beef and pork hot dog. Then it's covered with a chili sauce. And the chili sauce is where Coney owners can improvise and innovate. And then on top of that, it's going to be a yellow salad mustard and diced onions. 
and never any ketchup. If you put ketchup on a pony dog, you might get thrown out of the restaurant. Definitely a controversial condiment here. Definitely no ketchup. But I see ketchup behind. We that... sell french fries. When customers come to the carryout and want, you know, I'll have a coney with everything. Every once in a while you get, okay, I want ketchup on mine too. We don't do it. We refuse to put the ketchup on the hot dog. And we've had people who got a little upset with us. I'm like, dude, I'm not putting ketchup on the hot dog. Your, your grandfather immigrates here from, from, from Greece. Greece. Why hot dogs? It was something that he had seen when he landed at Ellis Island in New York. He saw, you know, the amusement park. You gotta remember, he was a young man, came over with no money, I mean, borrowed a pair of shoes. He heard the automotive business was hiring in Detroit, made his way to Detroit, thinking they'll hire me even though I don't know read or write. They didn't. On this little corner right here where we are now, he started a little push cart. You know, we're Greek, right? We know food. So grandpa remembered the hot dogs, made a Greek chili sauce. Our chili's a little unique. You hear about a Coney Island hot dog. You yes. think about Nathan's in New York City. But here's the difference. I'm going to stop you. Okay. A Coney Island in New York is an amusement park right. that sells hot dogs. In Detroit, a Coney Island is the actual, it's the hot dog with the chili mustard onions on it. That's the difference. And I got a lot of heated arguments people about that. Really? In Detroit, it is the actual thing you're eating. Thanks to my grandpa. Because he named it American Coney Island. He was so grateful he was in America and all the opportunities were given to him. Grace now in charge of carrying on the family legacy. It's obviously been passed from generation to yes. generation here. But each time you lose a member of the generation, it, it's got to be tough. You just lost your dad. Yes. Uh, not too long ago. Yeah, six months ago. When you come in, do you feel him here? I do. I, I, yes, I do. And I feel a sense of pride. I miss him a lot, obviously. But I, I just feel his presence. I feel everything he, he taught me. My grandpa did his thing. Then once my dad stepped in and took over, he took it to the next level. Then I took it to a whole nother level, with my brother's help included. Grace's brother, Chris Soderopoulos, helps run the business today. There's an American outpost at the Detroit Zoo, plus a new location in Las Vegas. They're also shipping Coney kits all across the country. You get everybody yeah. from all walks of life, exactly. every demographic, every racial component, you everybody it, comes here. Yes. The American Coney is the great equalizer. It, that's, I love the way you put it that way, Al. Exactly. We love the, our customers. I mean, our customers are like family. It's no joke. This is who made us. So we treat you like family. We don't know any different. Coming up, I learn how to make the quintessential cone. One up! Right there, nice shot. Hey. At American Coney Island, the oldest family-run Coney spot in Detroit, they keep things traditional. But you know, as I look at your menu, and I look at the pictures, they're uh, vintage, let's That's say. It doesn't look like you have strayed that much from the original menu. We haven't. 
I, I won't. Why add to it when it's working? You know what else is working? Me. I got behind the grill with Grace to prep the perfect plate of conies. This is the proprietary hot dog. If you notice the natural casing. Yes. It's a 90% beef, 10% pork with a lambskin casing. That's that, like three meats in one. You exactly. Get. Pork, beef, and a and that's lamb. That's right. And that's what makes it pop. Like when you bite into it, oh, it snaps snap. like a party in your mouth. Yes. yes. That detail kept popping up everywhere we went. It's a warm bun. It's the, it's the snap of the hot dog. When you bite it, you hear that pop. You can tell it's a natural casing because when you bite it, it snaps back at you. The steamer bun. Ah. And that's they, what we were talking. They're in a oh, steamer. See, you know, there's just enough steam in mm -hmm. here. So you're gonna pull out the bun. Right. Look, look for the cut. Yep. So open it up a little. Grab your plate. Yes. All right. So we're gonna grab one. Right. Come over here. Do you want to top it or do you want to? I want to watch the top. Okay. Give it a little mix. Little, this is that. Little juice. Greek. Yeah, that's right. It gets a little messy. Some chili. Add a little more. You know, mm -hmm. be cheap with the chili. Greek spices. Yes. That's the magic. The secret spice blend. Well, it's secret. But the chili is made with ground beef. The tangy mustard. Tangy. Just a little lime, nothing nothing more. You take some onions, sprinkle them across, and there you go. Boom. Okay. 105 years. 105 years of magic. magic. My turn. I get a plate. I need one up, which means I one. need one for a customer. One for Everything a customer. Everything on it. Chili, mustard, onions. Get the split. Open it up a little more, El. A little All more? Right. It's not too bad. OK. <laughs> Boom. All right, now keep, I come over here. Keep the bun open because you want oh, the chili oh, to go in. Oh, you want the there. chili to go yeah, in. Yeah, you want the chili. You want it, yeah. You want that chili. Don't chintz out on Get that chili. Little, don't chintz on the chili. Turn your dish a little so it's easier oh, for you to pour over there. All right. It. Oh, that really it does have a creamy See, consistency. See, it's really creamy, right. Exactly. A mustard. There you go. Ooh, that's heavy mustard. Did they order heavy mustard? Um, no, they didn't. <laughs> I, I'm making this for myself. <laughs> exactly. There you go. All right. One up. Ready. They are a nice shot. Yeah. Awesome. Woo. Good job, Al. Hey, now. Life changing experience. Mm. It's magic in your mouth. Every great Coney needs a great bun, but not just any bun will do. A few miles from downtown Detroit is another family-run institution that's keeping the Coney tradition alive. What started as a small baking business is now one of the state's biggest suppliers of Coney buns. And that bun is the Coney Island Steamer. That's a good bun. The Coney Island Steamer is a six-inch hot dog bun. 
At Metropolitan Baking Company, they like big buns and they cannot lie. The Coney Island Steamer Bun is our flagship item on the bun and roll line. Not to mention, they claim to have buns of steel. These buns sit in a steam table. The product's formulated for that steam table. That bun is going to sit there and it's not going to fall apart on you when you load it with all those condiments. In Michigan, Coney dogs aren't just a tasty meal. They're big business. The Coney business gave rise to supplier industries just as the auto industry did. So we need to have a major bun maker here. The big maker nowadays is Metropolitan Bakery and they bake these Coney dog buns with the sponge dough method. For three generations, the Cordes family, who also traced their roots back to Greece, has risen to the occasion selling specialty breads. Metropolitan Baking Company was founded by my grandfather in 1945. In the beginning, Metropolitan only sold simple loaves. Today, they produce dozens of items for grocery stores, high-end restaurants, and of course, Coney Diners. And while their products have changed over the years, a few names have truly stood the test of time. He was George James Cordes, uh, namesake, and my father is James George Cordes, and I'm George James Cordes. My father, just like me, was, was, was bred in the business. George credits his father for the company's massive expansion in the mid-80s. This summer, we're going to be producing millions of Coney Island steamer hot dog buns. This abundance, pun intended, is all thanks to automation. Automation is, is really what transformed this company. We went from packaging maybe 10, 15 loaves of bread a minute to 140 loaves a minute. In 2001, after years of recipe testing, the signature steamer bun was added to the product line. It is a hot dog bun that we've formulated to be used at the Coney Island restaurants um, in Metro Detroit specifically. This bun that we produce is in roughly 95% of all Coney Island restaurants. And it takes a lot of dough to make all those buns. So what we're doing right now, this is where it all begins. This is the mixing room, and we're about to create a 1,600 pound dough batch of hot dog buns. Major ingredients are gonna be flour is 65%, you know, then you've got your yeast, you've got your sugar, you've got your oil, you know, and a bunch of, bunch of proprietary ingredients. Any minute. That's um, roughly 1,200 packages of Coney Island Steamer hot dog buns. There you go. You did it. <laughs> that makes over 14,000 buns. After mixing, the dough gets cut into bun-sized portions. You're looking at three-foot sheets that were just guillotined, and now they're going into a smaller divider to be put into roughly uh, 1.25 ounce dough balls. Next up, time to proof. After 60 minutes, the dough has risen. And after about 10 minutes bake time, we're gonna have a fully baked hot dog bun that's prepared to cool. The buns are almost ready. The product's sliced, you know, after the cooling conveyor, and then it's paddled on top of each other to create a 12 pack, a dozen buns. The baskets are headed down to logistics and ready to be set up for routes. Then it's off to stores in Michigan's finest Coney restaurants, including American Coney Island. While the factory may have a lot of machinery, George has always been hands-on. So I worked here every summer throughout high school and throughout college, almost every position. And you really learn what hard work is as a kid to work in a bread factory you know, when it's 110 degrees out. When Grandpa George started the company, he had fewer than 10 employees. Today, they've got almost 100. When they say employees, family, family employees, that's the John. He's literally family. John Grabowski has worked with all three generations of the Cordes family. At 12 years old, he took a summer job washing buckets at Metropolitan. Today, he's the plant's lead engineer. It's like family. When you come to this business, everybody that's here, they feel like family to me. Everybody says hello to each other. It's a good camaraderie. Everybody likes each other. It's more than just bread and butter for the employees. It's really nice being run by a family on business. It, you can come to work and feel like you're at home. It's like a second family to me. We all work together, we, you know, we get down in the dirt, you know, we exchange uh, all kinds of work habits and we learn from each other and we do the best we can. The longtime employees are proud, keeping Detroit's Coney tradition going strong. We all grew up eating Coney. 
right? Comerica Park, you know, baseball games as a kid with mom and dad and the grandparents, family time. Pony dogs go, that's a part of pretty much everybody's childhood. It's a joy to be a part of that heritage. Today, Metropolitan's running six days a week, 20 hours a day. The amount of product that we're sending out each day, from the first dough that's kicking out around 1.30 in the morning till the final package at 10 at night. I feel constant pride. As for the future, George's kids seem to have inherited his love for the bakery. My daughters, Cecile and Sloan, I, I bring them almost every Saturday. They actually tell me that they enjoy it more than Disney World. This is their favorite place on earth, just like what it was for me as a kid that age. It's that joy and a family legacy that George hopes will carry on for many years to come. I absolutely love what we're doing here. I love our history. I never want to be that third generation cliche. You know, I want to continue the growth with my kids, with my kids' kids, have them look back, family members, and say, wow, that's incredible. Look at what you've done. Chili, mustard, onion. What happens if you reverse it? <laughs> oh, you're out. You're out. You're out. You're out. <laughs> Minutes from downtown is Detroit's Brush Park neighborhood. Folks here are flocking to enjoy the good vibes at this cool county spot. CMO may be relatively new to the game, but loyal fans can't get enough of their chili, mustard, and onions. CMO, get it? But unlike most diners in town, here, the coney, the sauce, and everything else on the menu is powered by plants. My name is Pete Lacombe. I'm the owner of Chili Mustard Onions in Detroit, Michigan. You could say opening a vegan coney spot in the coney capital takes guts and grit. And that's exactly what this family's made of. I don't follow any rules. I follow the important ones, but I don't do what everybody else does. Pete and his wife, Shelly, along with their daughter, Darla, launching CMO in 2018. It's the first and only all-vegan Coney spot in Detroit. I would say my wife gave me the biggest kick in the butt to go vegan, and we did. I had a vision that we were gonna open a vegan Coney Island, and I told Pete that, and he told me I was out of my mind. Pete and Shelly have enjoyed many a traditional Coney as lifelong Detroit residents. When Shelly and I got married, she used to tell me all the time that I was going to open a restaurant and it was going to be a vegan restaurant. And I said, yeah, I'm not vegan. So I asked her why she thought I was going to open a vegan restaurant. She said, you could never hurt an animal or sell animals. And I went, ah, oh, you're so right. Now, the family's been vegan for over 10 years. It not only saved my life going vegan and saved my life by doing something I love, um, I got to do something I love every single day with the people I love. Before entering the restaurant business, Pete worked in the auto industry, just like his dad and his granddad. When I was in automotive design, I ate horribly. 
I smoked cigarettes, I drank a lot. It was just kind of the norm in that field. That was really in my blood, but it wasn't in my soul. Cooking was in my soul. Pete's true passion coming from spending time with family in the kitchen. So we lived really close to my grandparents and what was in my soul was food. I cooked with my grandmas all the time. My grandma, my mom's mom, really should have opened a restaurant. And um, I feel like I'm living that dream through her. That dream now possible with the next generation. So Darla's our manager and she takes care of the customers so well. And seeing the woman that she has become, we're so proud of her. My wife and I, we've been through so much with partners and crime, partners in life, partners in love. And partners in creating a home away from home for every customer. I created CMO, the interior to reflect like my basement or my living room where you could come over and eat at my house. Everybody's welcome in my home. Every day, somebody wants to go tell him how fabulous this place is and how blown away they are with his food. Since it first opened, CMO has been delighting vegans and non-vegans alike with their take on hot dogs smothered in chili. The amount of love and emotion that is put into the food and every bite, you can tell that. I've never had vegan food, but it was really, really good. It just tastes so similar to it would as a, a regular Coney Island. You know, it's hard to come by something that's like so close to like a childhood favorite. Of course, I had to see if this Coney truly lived up to the hype. Hey, Al. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Welcome to my kitchen. Well, this is really cool. We've heard all about this. When you're used to something that is meat. Yeah. You know, getting them to try something that doesn't quite fit what they think it's supposed to be. For me, I let my food speak. If I put something out there on a plate that is incredible, happens to be vegan, that, that changes minds and hearts and, you know, it's incredible. I see your, your, your wife and your daughter standing out there. Are they taste testers? Oh, <laughs> my wife for sure, yes. That's love. It is, oh, it's love. <laughs> And we'll be married 30 years this year. Congratulations. So. Thank you. Let's make some vegan magic. Let's do that. The, the hot dog, what kind of protein is this? It's a pea and soy protein. And this is your chili. What's yes. The, now, what's the protein in here? For this chili? is beyond uh, crumble, uh -huh. a plain beyond crumble. A lot of Coney places are hush-hush about their chili, but Pete was willing to dish a little. How do you make your chili? I use a blend of spices, salt, pepper, garlic, onion, and a few other things that are top secret. <laughs> We're gonna throw that in our water. Okay. That's the hero right there. Right there. The spice is the hero. The chili's brought to a boil, then thickened with potato starch. It was time to try my first vegan coney. That's a healthy ladle. It is. I usually do a little more than that. Wow. So, yeah. Do a lot of onions. Here they are. Let's give that a shot. That's really good. Especially the chili. Thank you. How long did you have to work on the chili recipe? You know, I, I hit it right on the head when we first went vegan, mm -hmm. and then I didn't write it down. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> so then it took me about a year after that to really nail it down. But even with a winning recipe, times have been tough for CMO. What was the pandemic like for you guys? It hit us extremely hard, and we're still struggling and fighting, and you know, there's no quit in us, but it's been tough. Yeah. How's the future look for you? I really don't know. We're, we're trying. We're working every day, but I, I don't know what the future holds. I really don't. If it's based on the taste of that, your future's bright, my friend. Thank you so much. That I is good. It. Thanks so wow. much. Wow. The history behind Detroit's Coney Dog is truly an all-American tale, from the Greek immigrants who borrowed the name to a mashup of traditional flavors with a boardwalk staple. And now, there's a whole generation of locals who are ensuring that this regional hot dog is here to stay. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal 
has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William Franz Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960, or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists, and Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Ducky Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eatery is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Ducky Chase's. And I'm Edgar Duck Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Ducky Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chase's as a po'boy shop, becoming a full-service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase, Jr. and his wife, Leah Lange Chase, that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Dookie Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china, she wanted linens, she wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution years in the making. Post-1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African-American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. There were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace but that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall. The list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art 
was also celebrated here at Dookie Chase's when she gave African American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, passing away on June 1st, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades, from red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la dookie. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. In. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. The gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter Four. Being a fourth generation African-American restaurant tour is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family all day, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family and it's such a joy. And that joy, best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hello. Hey, yes. Enjoying everything. We are enjoying everything. everything. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie Chase, Chase to, to get, get myself my... some gumbo. When, when the service, service is right, they treat, treat you nice. nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together. A trip to Harlem.
just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, it was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trines Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's Restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X according to Professor Psyche williams Forson, The heart of civil rights is America because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks who are in the North, they still experience poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's, Dizzy Kalepsi, Ozzie Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. But racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events, just four years apart, sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire, and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open. Nothing was open. You know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken.
Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, Trinesse, wow. it's, it's so, so good, good to, to see, see you. It's been, so long. it's been way too long. I missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so. He, yeah. After a meal here, After yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, my baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. Executive chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's in. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you in the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, so, so we used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applied a dry rub to marinate the chicken. No, is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, yeah. See how gently he's putting it in there. Putting the baby to bed. Yep. They'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Oh, yeah. Wow. Like I feel her, I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. <laughs> you gotta pick up, your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to, I'm going to try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow. That looks perfect. Now this now is you're what, a thigh person. This is, so I, I know what you're person. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect. Wow, the seasoning is moist, crisp. Oh. Your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take this piece to go. Oh, I'm gonna pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you.
Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come, great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I could come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at B&G Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and uh, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas, and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here. But there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab, you know, once it became popularized. But in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ain't here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activists Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and Huey P. Newton come through the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. 
Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, man. Good to see you, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting up pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course, grits. Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward and how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now. They fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. <laughs> As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders. Ah, the avocado. From toast topping to sweet treats, even mac and cheese, this tasty green fruit is pretty much everywhere. But did you know the most popular variety, the Haas avocado, was developed right here in Southern California. So I came all the way across the country to find out how 